Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Mojnitsky. I'm the president of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society, and uh, tonight we're doing our first virtual star party. Uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, we've had to cancel all of our public star parties. Um, it's just too dangerous to have 150 to 250 people in one location. So here I am in my backyard, alone except for the birds. Um, hopefully you can hear me pretty well. Um, I've got a good mic, I've turned on the gain, and I've put a furry little hat on it to help with the wind. We'll see how well this goes. And I've got the telescope set up behind me. There we go. Um, so we have tonight a 4-inch apochromatic refractor, a Teleview 101, and we have a 8-inch uh, Schmidt, sorry, 8-inch uh, Ritchie Cretan. It is a, um, uh, it's the same optical design as the Hubble. This is meant as an astrograph, not really a visual telescope. So I've got cameras hooked up to both of them, but it is still light out, so it is not yet dark enough to do anything. I think the birds are flying off, so hopefully they will keep flying off for a bit. Um, so what we have to do now is wait for it to get dark. So we can either sit around and do nothing until it gets dark, or we can talk about some other stuff. So there is a bit of a delay uh, between what I am sending out and what is live on YouTube. It's about 10 to 15 seconds. So if you type in a question in the chat, I will see it. Uh, I may not respond right away because I've got to get back to it and read it but we'll see what it is so I see we have uh, some of the members from the Fort Worth Club here I see we have someone uh, Jerry from Springfield uh, Massachusetts uh, Wow I wonder how you got here so uh, yeah let's go ahead and start um, since it is st still dark, uh, we can't really do any observing. The telescopes aren't ready. I don't have anything aligned yet. Uh, fortunately, I do have a, a Celestron StarSense on this mount. It is a, a Celestron CGEM DX. It can handle the uh, uh, the weight of two telescopes and cameras and everything else on there uh, without many issues. Um, and I have a Celestron StarSense hooked up to it. This is, I like to call it, semi-auto magic. Um, it is a little camera that takes a picture of the sky, um, analyzes it, we call it a plate solve, figures out what it's pointing at, and then goes over to another part of the sky and does the same thing. And it does it about between 8 and 12 times until it has a picture of the sky, and now it knows where it is and where the telescope is positioned and what the telescope is pointed at. But it needs a dark sky to do that. So in the meantime, we can do some other stuff. Um, oh, I can see it's getting darker and darker and darker in just the last couple minutes. One of the things that we do as a club is a lot of outreach events. It's not just star parties. We do things like um, museum events at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. We do local events, um, uh, bicentennial days in Crowley, for example. We do events at libraries in in Crowley, in Irving. Uh, last year we did the um, uh, Apollo 50th anniversary celebrations at, at the at Crowley, at Irving, at the UTA Planetarium, um, and at the museum as well. So we do these different events just to get out, out to the public, to show the public what we can do. And one of the things that we do is drag out the meteorites. So I actually have um, a number of meteorites. Um, some of them are larger. Here is one that is fairly decent sized. It's kind of hard to see, at least in the dark like this. In the daylight, it's a little bit better. So here's what I'm going to try to do. I've got a little portable studio light. Really portable studio light. So let's see how well this lights me up. Okay. Yeah, this is the first time we're doing this, so bear with me. Okay. So here is a little meteorite. Actually, we'll do it this way. Here is a neat little meteorite. So this is the first one I ever got. And if you look at the outside, it's all kind of shiny and it's kind of smooth and it's kind of melty. We call this the fusion crust. So the fusion crust is what differentiates a meteorite from any other rock on Earth. 
And I really like this one because it's big enough to hold. It fits quite nicely in the palm of my hand. Let's get it out of it. Get a bit better focus. Eh, it's kind of hard to do a decent focus on it. But that's okay. So what we're going to do is instead take a look at the surface. Hopefully this will work. There we go. Ah. So I'm going to switch over. Okay, um, whoa, uh, looks like I do have audio, but this is way too loud. Let's turn this way down. Okay, I'm using the camera audio. Looks like we had a bit of a problem. Um, nuts. I am wondering where the sound went out. Okay, so in the meantime, um, let's see. I still don't have decent audio, and it's a little bit loud. All right. We'll do the best we can. So, let's talk about that surface. Let's see we go. Okay. No, y'all, uh, y'all didn't lose sound. It's, uh, it was me. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but it looks like the um, one of my my microphone actually went out. I'm not even sure why. I'm not even sure how. But nonetheless, the mic is out. At least the cameras aren't out. Um, I went ahead and turned on the sound for um, the webcam, so I don't think it's quite as good. It's a little bit noisier on the wind, um, but we'll go back and, and see if we can figure out what's going on with the uh, um, with the the good one. So I'm going to see if I can light myself up a little bit better if this is going to work. Okay, so hopefully you can see me pretty well. It is starting to get dark. It's not quite dark enough yet but we'll do the best we can. Okay, what do I have here? This is a meteorite. This is called Northwest Africa 8327. Let's see if I can get a decent focus on it. Get it in. Okay, here we go. So all these little shiny bits that you can see, this is nickel iron. That is nickel iron on there. So what's really neat is I can see These little bitty gray flecks, and I can't get a cursor on this thing, but that's okay. The little bitty gray flecks on there, um, those, the little round bits, those are the chondrules. So this is a chondrite, 
It's actually an LL5 chondrite, if you want to be specific. And it's got a little bit of nickel iron in there. It is not, um, not a whole lot, but it is enough to be a little bit shiny. If you want to, go ahead and take a look. Uh, while you're doing this, you can look up uh, in Google. Just type in NWA8327, and it will take you to, oh, what is it? A, one of the um, um, Meteor uh, uh, catalog sites, and it will tell you about this rock. It will tell you where it was found, who found it, uh, what it's composed of, um, and there may be a couple pictures. So what I'd like to show about this one is it's just really, really pretty. And what I typically hear from people is, oh, I would love to make a, a countertop out of that. Or it looks like Italian terrazzo. It says concrete flooring. Um, and it is. It, it's very, very pretty. But at about uh, one to two dollars a gram, that would be a very, very expensive countertop. So if I flip it over, that's the fusion crust. So the fusion crust is that burnt outside again and what we can see flip it back let's go to the very edge that fusion crust does not extend down into the center it doesn't go at all into the rest of the rock it the the interior is not heated at all so what's happening as it's going through the atmosphere um, the outside is being ablated it's it's going away um, and it's taking the heat with it so the heat doesn't get to the inside of the rock. We have something called ablative shielding for um, like a, a heat shield on a re-entry vehicle. Some of the material gets burned away and it takes the heat away. Now, what's really interesting about this is something a bit larger, like the size of, um, or of the one that I had before. So here's another one that's pretty decent sized. This one, if it would have hit the, when it hit the ground, it would have been going only about 200 to 400 miles an hour. So not the 72,000 uh, kilometers per hour to 140 plus thousand kilometers per hour. Uh, it would have just been, you know, what is it, uh, call it uh, 200 to 400, so that is... 500 to 700 kilometers an hour, eh, roughly. Um, so it would have been quite fast. It would have hurt if it, if it hit you, um, but not nearly nearly as fast as it was going through space. But the outer surface ablates. It goes away. The inside is still going to be the temperature of space. That's why it's not affected by the heat. And because it's the temperature of space, which is what, plus a couple of kelvins, um, minus, call it minus 270 degrees Celsius. When it hits the ground, within a couple moments, it will frost over. It's just that cold. And so if you ever happen to see a meteorite land in front of you and um, it frosts over, don't touch it because you will get frostbite. Your, your fingers will stick to it. Okay, so uh, any... Um, I'm looking at the chat right now, see if anything's, uh, anything's going on. Okay. All right. So, y'all didn't miss much with me talking about the, the previous meteorite. That's, that's, I was just talking about the fusion crust. So, back to the fusion crust on this one. Um, again, this one is not very large. It's only about two centimeters across. That's why I have the microscope. Uh, microscope makes it really easy to see stuff. So this one looks totally different. And I'll zoom out a bit so you can see it hopefully a bit better. And now we're looking at the inside. The inside of it is at an angle, but that's okay. You see these cracks? You know what? I can only put this at an angle. I'm going to put this one back, and I'm going to get... The other piece of the same one. So here we go. Better. Let's get in and zoom. All right, zoom in. Or get closer at least. And see how this works. Okay. So this one has quite a bit of iron flex in there. It's a lot of shiny stuff, and I know it's reflecting the the lights off of the. Uh, uh, off the camera there's not a whole lot that I can do but I can try to do this all these cracks within it though 
What's interesting about this rock is you can see along here, totally unchanged material, and you can see some of these metal bits inside the nickel iron. And then we get to one of these cracks. And what happened was that sometime in the past, this rock was either sitting on an asteroid, part of an asteroid, um, maybe even part of a, a small planetesimal, we just don't know. But it was hit, and it was hit very, very hard. Hard enough to crack the rock, squeeze it together, and melt along these cracks. So this is metamorphic material along these cracks here. It's getting almost dark enough, just a couple more minutes. So along these cracks it melted, and when I flip it over, this is the broken part. And it's much easier to see in person as opposed to on this camera. But along those cracks, this is actually a ridge extending from the other side. Here we go. So this right here is a ridge. It is harder material than the material over here or the material over here on either side. And so this just really sticks out. My wife came to see what, what, uh, what's going on, what we're doing. Um, so this rock is, um, is something that was processed, was modified, and is not original. And if I hold it up here, it's really, really pretty. And you can see some of these ridges along, especially if I rotate it. Um, it it's just a really, really pretty rock. Um, but this one is unnamed. This one is a Northwest Africa unclassified. And meteorites get named when they're important. If, if there's something important about them, if there's something interesting about them, if they get sent off to be analyzed, um, then they get a name. Otherwise, we just call them unclassified. And there are so many meteorites in, in uh, Northwest Africa that it's just NWA XXX. So I'm going to find... There we go. So this is the one I always like to pull out. This one, right back in the middle. This one is Northwest Africa 11421. NWA 11421. This is a lunar meteorite. This is actually a piece of the moon. So at some time in the past, a rock of some size hit the moon somewhere in the highlands and um, made a crater and knocked off a large chunk of material that went some of it landed back on the moon some of it went around and around and around the moon and eventually landed and some of it escaped the moon's gravity and eventually landed on earth um, we don't know how long it spent in space um, we could actually do a study on that. There's a method called, um, I think it's cosmic ray dating, and what it does is it looks at the damage. Um, I believe it looks at damage to crystals and to the surface of a, of a rock by cosmic rays, and um, uses that to figure out how long it's been out in space. Um, I guess if this would be on the surface of the moon, um, that dating might not be terribly accurate. Um, if it was uh, buried deep down um, under the surface, it would probably be more accurate. I don't think anyone's done any studies of this rock. We would really need something with surface material. Uh, this particular rock, it's about 914 grams of it was found. Um, it was actually sold by, it was found by somebody out in the desert in Algeria, and it was sold to a dealer in Algeria. And then it was picked up by uh, two meteorite hunters I know, um, uh, Marcin Chimwa and uh, uh, Tomasz Jakubowski. So their names are actually on the, um, uh, on the entry for this rock, for NWA 11421. So I'm seeing if anyone's uh, doing anything. No, not yet. Okay. Pretty close to being dark enough. Okay. So, let's talk just a little bit about this one. This is a um, piece of hi lunar highland breccia. So this came from the highlands. There's 
very, very little, almost no nickel iron in it. It's just silicate rocks. The white stuff is clasts. The black stuff is the cement that holds it together in a breccia. So this is just one side of it. If I flip it over, you can see more of the, the clasts uh, and the, uh, the cement. Uh, wrong direction. Let's get to there, yeah. So this is one of my favorite rocks uh, just because I can go ahead and take, um, uh, I take this out to star parties and I take this out to, uh, to other outreach events. What's really fun is I can put this in a kid's hand. I don't tell them what this is. I say, uh, you know, can you guess where this is from? And some people actually get it right because it is gray and the moon is gray. So they figure it's a moon rock, uh, but other people just don't have a clue. And I, I tell the parents, go ahead and get your phone out to take a picture. And then when they, they've got the phone ready, I'll go ahead and say, uh, it's a moon rock. And, and the kids tend to love it. it it's, it's something interesting. It's something neat. I like to say that NASA doesn't let you hold their moon rocks. Uh, if you go down to uh, um, Space Center Houston, they have a um, they have a little piece of a uh, like a little triangular piece of a moon rock that Apollo brought back, and they have it embedded in a block of lucite, and then they have another piece of lucite that goes over it. So what you have to do is you put your hand inside, you kind of get your fingers up and over, and then you can rub it just a little bit, and uh, that's it. So it's this it's a little black rock. And probably millions of people have rubbed it, and so it's worn nice and smooth, and it's black, and it's, you know, I touched a moon rock. Yeah, that's really cool and all, but, you know, I've got a moon rock of my own, and uh, I can actually take this out to places, and I can show it, and, and you know, kids love it, so. Um, it's now getting dark. All right, so time for some semi-auto magic. If you're just joining us, uh, we've been waiting for it to get a little bit dark. I'm Chris Mordnitsky. I'm the president of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. Um, we've had to wait for it to get dark. The crickets are coming out. The birds have gone to sleep. Uh, it's, um, there's a little bit of background noise. I'm not really sure uh, if you guys can hear me pretty well. Let me know if you have any issues with me talking uh, with any sound. But what I'm going to do now is grab the light and I'm gonna blast it some more so hopefully you can kind of see what I'm doing I'm not sure you'll be able to hear me terribly well um, but I've got the telescopes out there and um, what I'm gonna do is start the alignment procedure so I've got a little bit of light here uh, I'm actually gonna turn up a little bit more light here there we go, so this will light me up a little bit more from the screen. Uh, I'm trying something new, I'm trying something different here. I have a laptop in front of me that I can have some content on. I have uh, a monitor over onto the side, that's why I keep looking off in the opposite direction of whatever is on the screen. If I start looking over here, so it looks like I'm looking at whatever my content is, uh, I can't actually see anything, I'm looking out to my fence, and it's dark. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and start the alignment procedure. It'll take a couple of minutes, but I'll try to talk through it. So, all right. So I've got the star sense ready to go. I've got my handset here on an extension cord. Uh, Let's see if I this yeah, this is not enough of an extension cord. But I hope the video is good. If uh, the sound is good, please let me know. Uh, if the video is is okay, if everyone's seeing um, something nice, it's a. I think it was just hit by a bug. Sorry about that. Um, all right, let's go ahead and line it. So hit a line. Enter. Uh, let's see start. Enter. There we go. So I don't know if you can hear, but you can probably see the telescope moving right now. That's my neighbor. <laughs> so there are two telescopes on there. Uh, 
there is a four inch apo and there is a eight inch richie creighton so that's the black one that's barely showing up at all in the white one that's showing up is the is the four inch apo so the reason why i have two scopes on here is one telescope lets me do wide field views and that's the apo and the other one is um, it's an astrograph meant for a higher power so we'll be able to zoom in and, and see stuff tonight we'll see what we can find um, we're going to be trying to pick up comet atlas this is um, c 2019 y4 i believe um, let's check it let's see Yes, it is C 2019 Y4. Uh, this is a comet that was just discovered at the end of the year um, by the Atlas uh, Survey Project. This is an automated survey for tracking near-Earth asteroids. Uh, they pick up a lot of stuff. So something that's kind of interesting about this, um, uh, it took 48 years to find the first 10 asteroids. Uh, from uh, 1801 to 1849. So um, then we started finding more and more and more. But we didn't really start finding a whole lot until the late 90s, early 2000s. And the reason is we started doing automated surveys. Uh, the telescopes became computerized. The cameras became automated. The cameras became much better. So what we could do is take a picture of the sky, uh, and then move off, take another picture of the sky, another picture of the sky, another picture of the sky. We can have cameras that could record the entire sky in one night and then come back the next night and do it again. And then do it again. And then do it again. And do it again. Every single clear night they could, they would survey as much of the sky as they could. And then we could take those images and process them. We could send them to a computer and tell the computer, hey, can you go ahead and see if, uh, if there's any changes? So it would line up the stars and then see if there were any little dots that changed position. And this is the way that we found Pluto um, is it, uh, back in the early 20th century. Uh, Tom Baum, Baumgarten, I think his name was. Someone's going to correct me on that, and that's fine. Uh, so if someone wants a bigger video, all right, fine. We'll switch out from the meteorite and go back to here. So, again, I'm Chris Mordnitsky. I'm the president of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. Um, how's that? Okay, so it's still doing its thing. Semi-auto magic. It's doing some plate solving to figure out where it's positioned in the sky. It's 829 right now. Um, so it's got a little bit more to do I'm trying to figure out where it is. And then once it tells me that it's all done, well, I should be able to hopefully start taking a look at something. Um, anyone have any suggestions other than the comet? Uh, I can see I've got a star chart application on here. Let's see. I use um, Starry Night. And I can see Orion is... Let's see. Block that out. Yeah, Orion is still up, so we can probably do the Iron, or Orion Nebula. Um, M42, and I will do this. Let's see. If I switch over to here, we go. So, this is um, my little application I use, and uh, I do use it to control the telescope. I don't know if that's going to work out for us well here, um, but ideally, what we want to be looking at is the Orion Nebula in just a bit. Um, if you look at the Facebook site uh, on the image gallery, I went ahead and put on um, a picture I took of the Orion Nebula from a couple of, probably a month ago or so. Um, it's the first one in the gallery. Um, I went ahead and uh, just put it up on there. That was just a test to see what I could do. I don't know if we're going to get that extensive um, tonight, but we'll see what we can find. I think, uh-oh. Well, it's not good enough. Okay. Back. Let's try it again. All right. Apparently, it was not dark enough to get a good alignment. So, I'm going to try again. It's gotten a little bit darker in the last couple minutes. Um, usually, this about this time is, is enough. But, yeah, we'll find out.
Um, it may be that I need to go ahead and kill the lights. It could be that the light is, is interfering. I've got little barn doors on this studio light, so now you can see me and the, uh, the telescope is, is uh, a little bit darker right now. Maybe um, it was shining too much light directly into the camera. All right, so again, we're still waiting. Um, here's Orion, and I have Atlas over here marked off. Let's see if, uh, let's see roughly where it is. So I don't think it's going to show us anything other than that. Um, just get a little bit of data on it. Come on, information. There we go. Information. So what do we got? Um, description, position of the sky. We don't even have brightness yet. So uh, I think its closest approach to Earth was just a couple of days ago on the 23rd, 22nd, 23rd. So it is going away again. Uh, it has not reached perihelion, the closest point uh, where it gets to the sun, where it should brighten up um, considerably. Um, so we'll be waiting up for that in April. But distance to observer, well, this says it's getting closer to us. Okay, well, yeah, slightly. So, okay, we'll see. We'll see once I get a good alignment. In the meantime, yeah, I don't even have a, a brightness for it, so we'll leave it as it is, but let's try to find out where it is. So here's the Big Dipper, and I'm going to go put some labels on stuff. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Constellations. There we go. No, I don't want that. I don't want labels on the constellations. What I want is... Uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember how I got this set up. All labels, we don't want that. I want asterisms. Sorry, it's been a little bit since I used this. View, view, view. Constellations. Here we go. I want asterisms. There we go. Now we can see. So here is the Big Dipper. Here is the Little Dipper. Um, this is uh, Polaris right there, the North Star. So currently the, the mount is pointing at the North Star. Okay, so I'm looking at uh, the chat really quick. Clyde Tombaum. That's it. I knew it was something like that. Tom was in there somewhere. So... Um, let's do what app are we using uh, I am using uh, Starry Night Pro um, this is by simulation curriculum something like that but you can look up Starry Night Pro uh, I've been using it for a long long time um, and it gets me everything I need I can go ahead and uh, connect the telescopes or the mount to the software I hope I had issues with it last time We'll see if this lets us do it. Uh, it might be easier, but we'll find out. I'm going to take a quick look up. I don't see Venus in our field of view. No, I don't think we can pick up Venus. Let me step out to where the telescopes are. Okay. Yes, dear. Uh -huh. I left it in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, upstairs. On the bar. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, here we go. So, let's see if we can grab Venus real fast. Um, I did get the alignment. Good, good, good. Enter. So, we're going to do... Um, solar system and I'm going to go to Venus enter and go to so I'm gonna go ahead and step over to the telescope because um, I've got to do some setup for it um, it will be pointed at uh, let's see we'll go this way again it will be pointed again um, at Venus but I've got to go through I've got to uh, turn on the cameras I have to focus the cameras and then we have to get the cameras working on here so again that's something that I really couldn't do while um, I was um, uh, while it was light out oh and we got the good microphone working again oh that's nice 
Okay, so uh, I think we're hitting the red on it. I will let me know if the audio is good. I'll turn it down just slightly. Let's see what that does. Again, I'm checking the um, uh, the chat. So if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and let me know. We've got the light up somewhat. Let me start blasting it. Um, hopefully the light will. Yeah, there we go. All right. Let's see. So I'm, uh, I've got Venus here, and I've got to zoom in a little bit more. I've got to get better focus on it. It is kind of hard to focus on. It's a little bitty bright spot. I'm going to do, let's see. Yeah, it's, uh. I'm not sure how well I'm going to be able to grab this picture um, with this one. Let me test something else. I'm going to switch over to the other camera and see how well this one does. Don't have this perfectly aligned. That's okay. Early days, everyone. Early days. Okay. So, here's what I got to do. So, um, so what I'm looking at here. Venus in the field of view. I'm going to zoom in. Right. Well, that's not good. Turns out I've got teething problems. There's your problem. So it turns out that my uh, adapter is a little bit too long and I can't actually um, get it into focus, which means I have to go get another one. Luckily, I've got like a billion other things, so let's go find one. Sorry about this. Again, early days, teething problems. Here we go. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing is to actually double stacking. I have a uh, astronomics. Is it astronomics? Um, oh, I can't remember the name of that company. Um, no, it's not astronomics. I'll find it in just a second. And I'm not using red lights because right now I really don't care about my night vision. Um, this is so I can just see everything and get it done. So I actually have a. Uh, this is an IDAS uh, filter. Um, so this is a uh, LPS D1. This is designed for a uh, DSLR, and it is a light pollution filter. And the one that I have on the camera is 
Astronomic. There we go. I believe that's a German company. But I'm not 100% positive. And that is a clip-on filter. It goes directly into the camera, um, right in front of the chip. So by double stacking, I'm hoping that I have better performance in like the skies. Uh, we'll see how right or wrong I am. Go. So I've got. There we go. Right. There we go. Now we can get to focus. Still focusing. Focus. That is very, very bright. But I have it. What I'm going to do now is it's pretty close to center. Um, one of the issues, uh, get closer to the mic. Um, are you guys hearing me okay? How's the sound? Um, okay, one of the issues that we have with having two telescopes like this, they're not going to be perfectly aligned. They're going to be a little bit off. So one telescope we pointed at one thing, another telescope we pointed at something. The way we fix it is we use a, um, an adapter. So I have a neat little plate on there which has uh, X and Y controls. Um, X and Y? No. Yeah, it's basically X and Y controls. So it will actually move the telescope in this direction and then move the telescope in this direction. So all I have to do is have two cameras on at the same time. I center the one, the, the big black one, that's not um, on the adapter. Then I go back to the other telescope and I move that one. This is really meant for guide scopes, um, but uh, I can use a, uh, um, a $2,000 APO as a guide scope. Uh, it's kind of overkill, but it is totally feasible. So what I'll do now is I'll modify it here by looking at the camera. So okay, centered in one direction and move down in the other direction, and there we go. So. I will switch over to these cameras in just a bit. Go to live views. Okay, cool. So tonight I do have an, a, a studio audience with me, um, known as the Peanut Gallery. It is my family. It, I don't know if you could hear them clapping, um, but yeah, we'll see how that comes out. I am a bit thirsty. Sorry, everyone. And I am also sorry about the airplanes. Um, I do live right near uh, Spinks Airport. So, um, yeah, there are planes going overhead all the time. And the last time I tried to do one of these, one of my neighbors was very curious about what I was doing. So he sent his drone over. And his drone was, uh, was flying overhead. Okay, cool. So, all right, what, I got a question here from Sadie asking, at what point did I become interested in astronomy? Um, as long as I can remember, um, I remember a third grade test and uh, um, it taught me a lot about uh, teachers and about other things. So in third grade, I remember taking a science test and the question that I couldn't, um, uh, I, I just couldn't answer was, why does the earth go around the sun? And the answer was just gravity. And I knew it was gravity, but I couldn't explain why it was gravity. I, I, I thought that the teacher wanted, why was it gravity? And I didn't have an answer. And I actually wrote down, because God wants it that way. This was at a Catholic school. I thought I could get away with it. I couldn't get away with it even there. So um, 
I think at that point I, I really started looking for answers and I just kept asking more and more questions. And I remember my first library card at, a, at the Fort Worth Public Library. And uh, my brother and I went and started checking out science books. I think we tried to check out about 150 books. And my mother said no. And the librarian said, uh, could you tone it down a bit because there won't be any books left for any of the other kids. So we did. We toned it down to, I think, about 20 each or so. But we, we burned through those in, in about a week and had to go back and, and got more books. Um, and I've always loved astronomy, and I've always had space books at home. Um, and my parents wouldn't buy me a telescope uh, when I was young. Um, we didn't really have the money for that. But I think I was about 19 or so, and I decided, you know what, I just want my own telescope. So... Um, I went out and bought my own telescope and I learned about how telescopes work and I learned about um, trying to do overkill on a very small telescope that wasn't made for what I was trying to make it do. I was trying to do astrophotography with a with a film 35 millimeter camera on a four and a half inch uh, F9 reflector on a very very skimpy mount um, I did all sorts of modifications to that thing. I actually still have that telescope in my office right now um, without the mount. And I just tried to do so much to it and, and I couldn't. And then um, I believe it was about 2002 or so, uh, I took a class on building telescopes um, with a gentleman named Tim Black. And uh, Tim Black had the side gig of helping people build Dobsonian telescopes. And um, so a Dobsonian telescope is, it's a, it's a simple telescope, it's a Newtonian on a mount that goes up, down, left, right. And it was first kind of, it was not really developed, but I guess you could say it was kind of, it was sort of invented by a guy named John Dobson, um, who was this really weird guy out of uh, California. And he was born in China to missionary parents, came back over to uh, the U.S. when he was young, and became a Buddhist monk. Um, well, the monastery in San Francisco threw him out because he would sneak out at night instead of uh, praying and meditating. Um, he actually snuck out, uh, got junk, and built telescopes out of it. So he actually ground his own mirrors out of uh, porthole glass from old ships and... Um, uh, uh, he built the tubes out of um, uh, concrete forms, like it, it's cardboard forms for concrete columns. And uh, he would make eyepieces out of broken um, uh, lenses, or sorry, he would take binoculars, broken binoculars, and use the eyepiece from there and shove it in and jury rig this little mount for it. And, uh, and use that for the eyepiece for the telescope. And it worked. It wasn't great, but it did work. And then he would just give away these telescopes. So for the last, I guess, about 30, maybe 40 years of his life, he was basically, um, he was homeless. But he would couch surf uh, from um, city to city to city and stay at people's houses. And one of the people that he stayed here in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth with was Tim Black. And so Tim Black, um, his side gig was building telescopes. And, and so I built a telescope with him and I liked it so much. It was a, it was a 10 inch daub. And uh, um, I, I liked it so much that I designed uh, and built two more telescopes, two eight inch daubs. I don't have them with me now because they're visual only. Um, and then from there just kind of exploded. I got uh, um, the, the Teleview from one of our club members. Um, he was. He said that he just couldn't drag it around, so I got it from him at a at a uh, club meeting. And uh, what's funny is I came home to my um, a brand new wife, and uh, I said, um, "I love you." And the first thing she said was, "What did you buy?" I said, "A, a, a telescope." And so, bought a telescope. Um, so I, that's the, the Teleview right here, and I would take this out to star parties and events um, because um, well, George Rood would have liked it, I think. Uh, um, 
it's one thing to go out to a star party and have like a really small telescope, a really cheap telescope, and people look through it and it's, oh, well, the view's not terribly impressive. Okay, fine. Um, but it's another thing to take a really, really nice instrument and take a um, something that uh, gives a really, really nice view and, and show it to people. So I'm trying to connect to... Uh-oh. What's that sound? Ah, well, that would do it. I forgot to hook up the, the, uh, the two cameras. So there we go. Let me go hook up the two cameras. I've been talking the whole time, and I shouldn't have. All right. So I've got cables somewhere here. It is almost always a waterfall of cables. Okay. So, let's try this again. Um, yay, T3i. Okay, so I've got two. Not sure how this is going to work, but we'll try. Okay, I'm going to switch to a different view. Okay, so here is an application called Backyard EOS. Um, there's also Backyard Icon, uh, Nikon, sorry. Um, so what this application does is this lets me connect into a DSLR, and I can go ahead and see what it's doing there we go so you can see my mouse here i'm going to go to framing and focus just to see which camera this is i've got no idea what camera this is there we go this would be the richie Creighton. okay cool so you can see it's very very bright i'm going to switch to planetary see what planetary is like um we're gonna have to go a lot Fast. Oh, there we go. That's much better. So Venus is very, very bright. And because it's bright, it's really, really hard to um, um, to get a decent picture out of, depending on what camera you're using. So right now, let's get it even slower. I'm going to get a whole lot slower. Okay. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make it dim on purpose. If there's too much light, it overwhelms the sensor, it bleeds out everywhere. But this way, I can actually come in, and you can see Venus is actually a little, um, well, half Venus. You can't call it a half moon because it is not a moon. And sorry about the little jiggle here. Uh, we have some wind. You can probably hear a little bit of wind noise coming off the, um, off the microphone right now. Let's see. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's any questions, any comments. There we go. Okay. So, um, yeah, talking about the telescope, so it, it's just kind of gathering bits and pieces here and there, and it's getting into astrophotography. Um, there is a really steep learning curve. I will tell you that at one point um, I spent probably two very frustrating years trying to figure out what I was doing wrong um, and I couldn't figure it out for the life of me I just could not figure out what was going on it is what it is so my house is literally over the uh, the landing um, pattern for Sphinx so they go pretty much directly overhead. Uh, in the summer, um, we have a pool in the back and we'll go swimming and the planes will fly right overhead. So again, is what it is. So what I can do right now is I can actually save this um, if I want to, but the seeing's not terribly good. We've got wind uh, shaking the camera around, uh, but you can see definitely that Venus has a shape. It's not a dot. It is not a... Um, um, it's not a, uh, a, a round disc, it is a half-lit disc. So Venus right now, it's at its closest, uh, it's not quite at its, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, um, 
maximum eastern elongation. Uh, that's going to be pretty soon, I think in a couple more weeks, I believe. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Sorry, I didn't prepare terribly well for tonight. That's okay. Uh, the greatest eastern elongation means that Venus is um, rises the highest it does in the western sky. Um, if it's the greatest western elongation, then that means it is the highest in the eastern sky. So if it's eastern elongation, it's at sunset. Western elongation, it's at sunrise. And it's almost time for Mercury's uh, greatest eastern elongation. Sorry, western elongation. Western. Because it will soon be visible um, a couple of degrees over the horizon right before sunrise. Uh, if you can get to a place where you can see the uh, eastern horizon, um, at that point you should be able to see, and it's a clear sky, you should be able to see Mercury. Um, the problem is, is that we're now in lockdown. So uh, the recommendation is to stay home. Um, we are being allowed to go out for walks. We can go to parks as long as we stay separate from other people. Um, but it's kind of the issue of, do you really want to be out where other people are? Um, uh, we went ahead and, and talked yesterday about our dark sky site. We have two dark sky sites uh, for our club, and um, it's probably not a good idea to go out to either one of them. One, we don't own either piece of land, and two, um, they're both remote. And if something happens to you while you're out there, someone may not come for weeks and in places the cell phone reception is kind of spotty so i'm doing this um, i do actually have a dark sky site south of town uh down in grandview at a cousin site but again i don't really want to head down there unless i absolutely have to um okay so we can see venus right now we can see it moving just a little bit in the sky uh the telescope is tracking um, it's not doing a terribly great job of it. I do have it polar aligned. It's not absolutely perfect. It's good enough. It, it is really good enough right now, especially if we're just looking at planetary stuff. Um, so we can see Venus. Anyone have any questions about Venus? Anyone have any anything they want to say? I have this on as fast as possible. I'm going to see, you know what, just for kicks and grins, I want to get this way. I want to see if we can see any surface detail. And, or cloud detail, I should say. I think I can see a little bit right there, but I'm not 100% positive. There's 100% fit 5X. I don't think we can zoom in anymore on this view. It looks like there's a little bit of a darker area right here. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but um, looks a little bit darker in this area. Uh, yeah, I don't see don't see okay uh, m42 so that would be Orion yeah we can swing over to Orion let's go ahead and do that I'll go back over and um, let's do frame and focus it should all be in focus but maybe not um, you know what we'll just leave it on planetary we'll see what pops up and then do longer exposure and let's do uh, let's do four second exposure so it'll be nice and bright. So we're, let's see what else we're picking up in the area. This is again in the um, uh, the western sky, so uh, there's not a whole lot to see there. And the spikes that you see are diffraction spikes. So this is caused by the the veins up in uh, holding up the mirror in the front. Okay, M42. We go to deep sky. I see Messier, enter, zero, four, two, enter. Enter, there we go. Alright. So, while that thing's going, um, so, for anyone who is not familiar with, uh, with catalog numbers, um, back in the 1700s, there was this French guy named Charles Messier, and he was a comet hunter. Well, Chucky only cared about comets and nothing else. So nothing else in the sky concerned him. He just wanted to find comets. Well, what he did was um, find a lot of stuff that isn't comets. And he got so tired of finding this stuff, 
and other people reporting the stuff as comets that he wrote a catalog um, a list of 110 objects in the sky that are definitely not comets don't tell me it's a comet don't come back and say I found a new comet when it's one of these things so to him this was stuff to rule out as comets it turns out what he found was 110 very interesting objects in the sky some of the brightest galaxies and nebulas uh, star clusters open clusters globular clusters and uh, um, and so the catalog has uh, the name of the Messier catalog and numbers 1 through 110. So what we're looking at is um, Messier 42 which is the Orion Nebula. Um, this is the Great Nebula in Orion. Um, it is a star making factory. I believe there are tens of thousands of stars in there so if we look here, let's go back to Orion. Here we go. So we see the belt of Orion there. There's the Belt of Orion. We have the Horsehead Nebula, which is really hard to spot from suburban skies. I've tried. It's not easy. Uh, I even have a dedicated monochrome camera with a hydrogen beta filter. It's still not that easy. Here is the Flame Nebula. So here's the Horsehead. Here is the Flame. And then just down from there is the Orion Nebula. So this is what we're looking at here. And if we zoom in, right in the middle, in this white overexposed part we have the trapezium so if we come over here zoom in there's the trapezium all right so the trapezium is um, the four brightest stars in the center of uh, of the uh, um, Orion Nebula go out so we can zoom, zoom in just a bit um, and then what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to we're just try some imaging. This won't take too long, um, but this is kind of what we do as astronomers. We just kind of uh, we sit in the dark all the all night long and take pictures. Now the advantage now is that a lot of the stuff we do is automated, so I can actually program this in. You can kind of see I'm um, uh, I'm putting in a one exposure, I can set it for a period of time. Uh, I'm going to set it for bulb, and I'm going to do a 60 second exposure. 60 seconds, ISO 1600. You know what? Before that, let's do a 30 second exposure. Um, I won't do a pause. I will do a mirror lock uh, for two seconds, save it to the PC, uh, and then I will go start capture. So now it's going. It'll tell me anti-vibration, and what it's supposed to be doing right now is taking a, uh, it's opening up the shutter, uh, sorry, it's opening up the mirror, keeping the shutter closed, waiting two seconds for the camera to stop shaking, open that back up, take an exposure for 30 seconds, and then close it back up again. Um, however, it's windy. I don't think we're going to get very good images today. Um, I don't have an observatory. I don't really have a, uh, a windscreen, and what's worse is I'm at the top of a hill, so I get all the wind. I'm not protected at all. Um, and the wind is coming out of the south, which is uh, where my house overlooks. So if it's coming from the north, I could have a little bit of blockage. Uh, I don't have that right now. So what you're seeing now is noise reduction. Um, Canon cameras have a neat little ability where um, you can enable it so that any exposure over a second will close the shutter, take a second exposure right away for the same length of time, um, and get what's called a dark frame. So it's no light is hitting the sensor, but it's still picking up basically infrared noise from all around. Yeah, well that was loud. Um, now we're going to wait for it to download. Um, should be pretty quick. Um, so what it, what it then does, is once it has a dark frame, it will subtract that from the light frame and get you that. So this is not half bad. Um, it's not the prettiest Im of images. But you can actually see some stuff in here. Uh, this is a reflection nebula that's uh, right next to it. You can see this dark band right here. Um, you can see a little bit of a feature down here. 
Um, you can see a little bit of a tail here. You can see a wing here. You can see different coloration here, different coloration here. You can make out the stars. Um, the stars aren't totally round, um, and that is because, um, well, the wind is shaking the camera and the telescope a bit. But it is, it's pretty nice. Um, for a 30 second exposure, that is not too bad. Now, if I zoom in, let's go zoom in a little bit more. You see all this graininess in it? I'm not sure how well that comes across on YouTube, but I see a lot of grain. Um, that's just noise. It's noise from um, just the warmth of the camera. And if I look up here, it tells me, damn, wow. Uh, 49 degrees Celsius. The camera is very, very warm. It's been on for a while, and it's actually kind of, compared to last uh, week or two, it's actually pretty warm tonight. I'm in um, uh, short sleeves, little t-shirt, and shorts, and, and I didn't put on any shoes or socks. And it is not terribly cold. Uh, I will admit I am well insulated, but it's not terribly cold. Um, I can always put on a jacket and, uh, and pants, um, if it gets any colder. So let's try this. Um, I'm going to take another 30 second exposure, but I'm going to bump up the ISO. Bumping up the ISO really just changes the gain. Uh, it makes everything brighter, but it adds the noise. So when we take uh, astro astrophotographs of pretty much anything, what we want to do is minimize the noise. And there are a couple ways of doing it. We can either lower the ISO, uh, try to get as low of a number as possible. Uh, we get a bigger aperture, a bigger telescope, a bigger mirror, a bigger lens, whatever we can do. Uh, we can also cool down the camera. So dedicated astronomical cameras often have um, uh, cooling fans and uh, thermoelectric uh, um, cooling systems. What, what these are, well, it's, it's a PN juncture, um, junction um, with a hot side and a cold side. And if you have seen wine refrigerators, especially some of the newer ones, they use these devices. There are little refrigerators you can put in your car that plug into a, a 12 volt um, system and uh, those work the same way. So what happens is you have a hot side and a cold side. The cold side you stick it up against your camera as close to the chip as you can. And on the hot side you put in a heat sink and you put in fans. And when you run a current through it, the cold side gets very, very cold. It can get uh, minus 20 degrees Celsius easily. Oh, that's blown out now. And the hot side uh, will get up into 50, 60, 70 degrees Celsius. So you have to have a heat sink on there and a fan to take away the heat or it will burn out. So um, I do have some cameras like that. I do not have them hooked up right now. I'm just using the DSLRs, so they're going to be pretty warm. So right now it's at 39 degrees because we have a nice little chill that's, uh, uh, that's helping out. Um, audio looks good still. Cool. Okay. So anyone, uh, anyone got any questions? Okay. So someone's asking what cameras I'm using. Uh, these are modified Canon T3Is. They're 18 megapixels. Um, and what I mean by modified is uh, the camera that you get um, straight out of uh, the camera store, Amazon, Canon, wherever you get it from, they have a couple of filters that are over the chip. Um, one of the filters helps with the uh, dust delete data um, and the other, and it does something else, uh, I think it's a partial infrared filter, the other one is a much better uh, infrared filter. So um, the CMOS chips and a lot of CCD chips uh, for cameras, they are very, very sensitive to infrared. In order to have natural looking pictures, you have to put a filter on there. So the filter blocks a lot of the infrared light. As astronomers, we want to see some of that infrared light because um, the red here that we're looking at in the Orion Nebula um, this is um, this is light that's emitted by hydrogen gas that's being excited by the young hot stars there in the nebula. These young hot stars are giving off a lot of uh, ultraviolet radiation. The ultraviolet radiation hits atoms of hydrogen, excites them, causes them to jump up one energy level, called hydrogen alpha, and then drop down again and emit one photon of one particular frequency. 
It's a very, very narrow frequency. So the frequency we perceive with our eyes is being a deep, deep red color. The filters that go on the cameras don't, um, they block some of that color. We don't want it to, block, to be blocked. We want to see as much of that color as we can. So uh, we modify these cameras by taking off these filters and making them much more sensitive to infrared. The downside of it is you can no longer use them for regular photography because every single picture you take in the daylight looks like a, an old photograph from the 1970s or 1980s that was sitting in a, um, in a uh, shoebox for the last 20 or 30, 40 years and all the blue and green pigment is faded out of it and everything looks red. Um, it's, um, um, yeah, not the greatest of things. So these are dedicated astronomical cameras. So I'm going to zoom in just a bit so you can see I got round-ish stars, but we're not seeing a whole lot of detail. We see a lot of this noise. We can see some of, um, over here, there's a, uh, um, see if I can play with the this somewhat anything here we go uh, no that's not gonna work blast it there we go let's just blast it so we can see some of these details I want to bring this down and over I'm just playing around right now so we can hopefully see a little bit here so this lets us see a little bit more detail but again there's so much um, so much noise and I don't want to see this noise so I'm gonna to try to do instead is a 60 second exposure and I'm gonna cut down to 800 ISO and let's go ahead and do it so um, by cutting down the uh, the ISO I'm gonna minimize the noise by making a longer exposure I'll have more photons hitting the chip getting more data um, we'll, we'll see what this is like okay any uh, any other questions? A bit unsharp, John? Yes, yes, it is. I, I'm I'm not doing any guiding right now. I do have a mini guide scope on there. Um, I do have a, a PhD running on this machine. Well, no, I don't have it running on the machine. I just have it um, available. Um, if you want to try guiding, PhD two, version two is the way to go. PhD actually stands for Push Here Dummy. Uh, it is a uh, nifty little program. What it will do is um, it will um, lock in on a star and it'll uh, send a signal to your mount saying go this way, go that way, go up, go down, and then how far does it go with each little push. Um, there we go, noise reduction time. So. Uh, the idea behind it is you have a separate scope with a separate camera pointed at a star in your field of view and then as um, sorry I've got crane flies coming to the lights uh, as the telescope moves and even if it's not tracking perfectly um, with the the gears that it has or the belts uh, whatever the drive system is um, PhD will go ahead and nudge the telescope so that uh, this star stays on the same pixel on the sensor or the same small group of pixels. Um, try to minimize that as much as possible. And so we increase the sharpness of our images. We can take much longer exposures. I've taken exposures of 20 minutes before. Um, there's an advantage and there's a disadvantage. With a, a long exposure, you get more photons hitting the chip. More photons means more data. Uh, more data means that you can process the image better. You can pull out more details. Um, the bad part is, is uh, if there's a little bit of wind in the camera or the telescope shakes, um, you can uh, lose data because now everything is blurred. Or you have a satellite that passes right through your field of view. We might even have that tonight. Uh, and when that happens, you kind of just toss out the whole image because now, you know, there's a satellite going through. It's a big, it's a big streak. Or an airplane goes through your field of view. All right, so this was a 60-second exposure at, um, uh, uh, at ISO 800. So if we go back to this one, this one I believe was, what, this was 30 seconds at 800, and we had a lot of noise, or 1600. Yeah, this was 1600, and this one was... 800 so we have a longer exposure and we have less noise 
but you see the stars are a little bit streaked out. I'm not doing any guiding, but at a minute, this is not too shabby at all. We can see some, um, oh, let's see, where's the zoom on here? We can see some data. I'm going to full screen it, just see what we can do, and zoom in just a bit. Okay, so we can see, um, we can see some of these little darker areas. So the dark areas are dark nebula. Uh, it is gas and dust that's not being excited at the time by uh, ultraviolet radiation. It's actually absorbing the light behind it. So if we look at the Orion Nebula here, this ridge line here actually continues, 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 and goes back here and then it goes down. But we have a dark cloud here, we have a dark cloud here, we have a dark cloud here, we have this dark cloud here, and a little bit of light peeking through, a little bit of light peeking through, a little bit of light peeking through. And then we have more over here. So this this cloud here maybe extends out to here, um, covering part of this reflection nebula, and it goes back up here. Um, I don't know for certain, but hey, check this out. We got a little bit more detail down below. Down here. So now we can see a little bit of light, a little bit of light, a little bit dark here. But we were able to, to pull out additional data just by having that longer exposure. So let's get out of here, go back here. And just for kicks and grins, I'm going to do a two minute exposure. And now let's knock it back to 100 seconds. 100 seconds, and let's see just how horrible this is going to be. And the reason why I say that is because the sky is already getting kind of green around here. So I'm, I'm certain we're going to pick up more data. I'm also certain we're going to pick up more light pollution. But, you know, them's the breaks. If you want less light pollution, you have to go outside of town. You have to go to a dark sky site. You have to go out. Um, here in Texas, uh, we have to go west of I-35 somewhere. So we either go... Um, we have a dark sky site north of Decatur. We have a dark sky site north of Ranger. Uh, we have other places that we can go. We can go to Big Bend. Really, some of the darkest skies in the United States are out in Big Bend. Um, it is far from anything. It is very, 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 very dark out there. It is so dark that on a moonless night uh, in the summer, the Milky Way can cast a shadow. Um, you can actually see it. Uh, I was out there in 2002. Yeah. Uh, on a new moon night, it was very, very dark. I did not know what I was looking at. Um, the sky was so full of stars. Um, I got lost. I couldn't even make out any constellations. I, I was just trying to figure out where I was. And uh, I did not spend much time observing because I had... Uh, um, while I was observing, I turned around to get a different eyepiece, and there was a fox sitting probably about 10, maybe not even 15 feet away from me. He was sitting down, he was just looking at me. And I paused, I looked at him, and, and he got up, and he walked off. Uh, and that got me to think, because um, I had just come in off of a two-day hike uh, that afternoon, and um, uh, the previous morning, when I was setting out, it had... Uh, rained the day before, and as I was walking out on the trail past the uh, um, the motel uh, in the in the high Chizos there, in the Chizos Basin, and uh, um, as I was walking on the trail, there was mud there, and in the mud there were fresh bear tracks. So the bears like to come out at night. I didn't really feel like encountering a black bear um, at night. Uh, down there with my telescope there so I figured um, I'm gonna go back to my hotel room so I picked up a 10 inch Dobsonian telescope uh, and ran it into my room turned around picked up the base ran that into my room came out again picked up a table with my eyepiece cases and everything else and ran that into the room and closed the door took a shower and went to sleep and that was the extent of my Big Bend adventure next time I'm there I will definitely do more observing um, I am a lot more experienced than I was back then, and I will do it instead from the desert, from the flats, where the bears tend not to go. Uh, oh, Sadie, you find this relaxing. Oh, well, thank you. I uh, hope my voice doesn't put you to sleep. Uh, I got another 30 seconds or so for noise reduction. Now, uh, when we do 
actual imaging sessions, um, typically we'll turn this off. The reason is it's kind of a waste of time to do it for every single image. What we'll do is we'll take a set of uh, dark frames, we'll cover up the, the camera, it will take a bunch of pictures at the same ISO, at the same temperature, uh, and just let it go. And just take 10, 15, 20 pictures, and then make a master uh, dark frame out of those images. And then we'll take light frames. Light frames are the ones that we're actually imaging objects with. So we'll take the light frames, and we'll do those for as long as we can. We'll try to get as much data as we can. The reason why I'm not doing light frames right now is, or sorry, why I'm doing the uh, the dark frame reduction right now is because um, uh, I don't want to bother with that. Um, uh, I'd rather just do it as fast as possible. There's less work overhead for me, and um, uh, okay, cool. All right, so. Um, The stars are not round. You can see they're a little bit elongated, and they're elongated because one, we have a little bit of wind, two, I am not guiding right now. So at two seconds, oh, sorry, two minutes, or 100 seconds of exposure, 100 seconds of exposure, we get a little bit more data. We can actually see a little bit more in here uh, than we could on the previous image. Uh, there's a little bit more detail, but the problem is it's all kind of blurred out. Um, there are algorithms that can actually fix the blur, but you can see the stars here, they have, they have two lobes. So what that tells me is that the mount jumped. It was tracking okay, and then it jumped. Um, or that there's... Um, no, that's really it. Because if there's wind, it tends to make these little, like Z patterns, jagged little bits. Um, they're not going to be round. They're going to move around a lot more. Um, we don't want that, so um, we kind of uh, uh, we want good tracking, but we also don't want wind. So in this case, I'm I'm going to stick to about 60 seconds. I think that's going to be a good number for now. Um, but you can now see a little bit more detail even, and by playing around with uh, with the histogram over here, I can try to pull out a little bit more data. So if if I bring this way down, you can actually see the trapezium in the middle. I'm going to zoom in again. So these are the four stars of the trapezium. Again, they're kind of blurred out, but it's what we got. Um, these are some of the stars around it, but the trapezium is what's lighting up the inside. And if I zoom out again, I can bring out more details in the outside. So let's see what I can do to bump up some of this detail. Uh, now, if I was using Photoshop, I could get a lot more granular control over it, um, but I don't have it installed on this one. I typically run that on my workstation in my office. Um, I actually have this set up in the winter occasionally where um, I have the laptop outside, I have the cameras all focused and everything is set up, and it's cold, and I don't want to be here. Um, sitting and waiting for images to download. So I go back to my warm office with a nice hot cup of tea and I remote desktop into my laptop and then I control everything that way. And then I can download images, I can upload them to, uh, to my uh, uh, network attached storage and then I can work with them on my workstation to my heart's content where it's nice and warm. But when we're out at dark sky sites, we bundle up. Uh, in the winter. Some of the neatest stuff like the Orion Nebula is uh, visible in the winter so we dress warm, um, chemical warmers for our hands and feet sometimes in our pockets and uh, and we try to do our best. Uh, we're out there just trying to get images. Uh, some of our club members go out or at least before the current crisis uh, to the dark sky sites as often as they can and all they do is they image one target. Uh, one of our guys um, was out last night from his backyard, I believe, and he was imaging one galaxy. And if you go to the Facebook group uh, into the um, the photo gallery, it's the, the last image there. Uh, it is, uh, I believe it's the Whirlpool galaxy. Is it the Whirlpool? Um, I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember which one it is off the top of my head, and I don't want to keep jumping windows. I'd rather leave it on here. So, um, 
M42. Any other questions? Uh, jump back to here. So again, for anyone joining us now, I'm Chris Modnitsky. I'm the president of the Fort Worth Astronomical Society, and this is our first uh, virtual star party that we're doing. Uh, we looked at Venus earlier. Right now, uh, as long as we can, we're looking at um, the Orion Nebula. I'm going to reset this and back to this. Now we can see some of the nebulosity a little bit better. Uh, but again, you can see on the outside, it's getting lighter for the light pollution. You can compare it to previous images. But we are getting a little bit more data. We can see a little bit more detail, even if that detail is a bit blurry, a bit stretched out, but them's the breaks. Um, not every image is going to be perfect. In fact, when we do our imaging, typically we keep, depending what kind of imaging you're doing, if you're doing uh, stuff like this, we typically keep the best 60 to 80 uh, percent of our images. Um, uh, we curate them and just pick out all the, the bad ones and keep the good ones. If we're doing planetary stuff, you may only keep 10% of the images, but planetary images, planetary imaging is a whole different ball game, uh, different processes. You basically take a movie of, uh, of an object, of a planet, um, Jupiter, Saturn, and then um, at high frame rates, and then you toss that movie into an application that will process every single frame and will toss out the bad frames and keep the good ones. And you may keep 10%, you may keep 1% of all the frames. But if you're taking 60 frames a second and you take, I don't know, 10 minutes, a half hour worth of, uh, of images, that's a whole lot to go through. So you're going to get some pretty good images. Um, I don't think I'm going to bother doing that tonight. We'll stick with the DSLRs and see what we can find. Okay. Anyone have any other targets? Um, oh, John said yes. It was the whirlpool M fifty one. So this is um, our galaxy that was taken. Um, all right. So I'm going to try something else. I have stuff that's connected there. Okay. So. I'm going to hope this works. I don't know if it will, but um, what I'm going to try is to hook up the um, um, the mount to the computer. I'm going to put away the meteorites. So if you're just joining us now, we had meteorites out. I still have one out here. I have a number of meteorites that we take out to uh, uh, outreach events, including a lunar meteorite. And if you want to see those, you can always go back and rewatch the video from the beginning. Oh yes, and like every other YouTube subscriber, or sorry, YouTube creator, uh, like and subscribe below. Here, somewhere. So, um, what's next? Okay, um, I was going to hook up the mount. Because what I want to try to do is find that comet. <sighs> Let's see how well this works. There we go. Okay, so we're back to Starry Night Pro. We were looking here, and now we're going to try to get to Atlas. Uh, you know what? I better keep it right here for now. And the reason is. I've got to make the connection, and I've got to see if this works. So, bear with me, everyone. I do have a headlight. It's in the house. I'll leave this open because there's more friction, and I can leave it there. Then... I have a USB cable which connects to the computer and the USB cable is connected to the handset right over here and the handset then talks to the, um, uh, the mount. So we're going to flip back over to here and we'll see if I can do this right. Any, uh, 
Any images? Any questions? Okay, yeah, we can try Whirlpool. I'm gonna try the uh, the Comet first. Um, the Whirlpool is actually close to it, so we can always jump. Um, let's see, where is it? So I have to keep finding my mouse every single time. All right, so Starry Night Pro lets me go ahead and do something called telescope, telescope control. I just have to hope this is going to work. Um, I had issues last time. If this doesn't work, well, nuts. So, Celestron driver, please work. I don't think this is going to work. I don't think this is going to work this time. Um, it's not picking it up. All right. Doop -doo. I'm going to move this off here. Uh, so I'm looking for ports. It says it's there. This doesn't like it. Show all COM ports. COM3, yay! Now it saw it. I'm hoping this works. Okay, COM port 3. Hello. Uh. There it goes again. Com port three. We hit OK. We hit OK. OK. Well, that's fun, isn't it? Though. There we go. Okay. Connect. I swear. This is... <sighs> okay. I don't know why this is not working. Why it's access denied. Uh, Alright, well... This is similar to the issue I had before, so we'll do this. Comet. Atlas. Okay, so here's what I need. I need some position in the sky. Okay. All right, well. As the old line goes, nuts to this. I'm going to tossed the cable off to the side and said we'll stick with this. Now the advantage of it is I can go ahead and type in a direct location. I just have to figure out how to do it. Uh, okay, I need to do... Actually, it's a good question. Where do... You know, I don't remember the last time I had to look up an object directly like this. So, what if I do... Not database setup back. Um, well, nuts. Okay, let's do this. Let's figure out where it is, and we're going to do some sky hopping. Because, um, star hopping, I, sorry. So, here's what we're looking at. We got the Big Dipper, right? Here's the Big Dipper. So, what I should be doing is I should see... Ooh, this should be easy. So, I get this star, which is what? Doobie. Dooby dooby doo. Someone's going to correct me. Someone will. Okay. And Polaris. So I need to go to Dooby right across, almost directly up of Polaris and off to the side. So fortunately, I have a wide field scope, which has a several degree field of view. 
Let's see if I have my field of view indicators. Did I program them in? I don't remember if I programmed them in. It is Canon on here. Ah, it'll be hopefully close. Um, yeah, Rigel, quick find the Telrad. Here's what Telrad. I don't have a Telrad. So, yeah, Canon 200 millimeter. I don't have the 200 millimeter on there, but I should have this. So my field of view should be actually should be bigger than that. I think that's bar load or something. Um, two degree field of view. I think mine is actually bigger. I think I have like a four degree field of view on there. So let's see if I can find it. Uh, I'm gonna go do this manually. So uh, bear with me. No night vision whatsoever. But that's okay. So, I'm looking at the Big Dipper. Okay, there's Booby. So, what I want to do is find it in the field of view. direction do I want to go? Nope, I'm going to go this way. So I have to consider where it is in the sky, and it's in kind of this weird position. If I was using a, um, uh, if I was using the Dobsonian, it'd be really super easy. I would just go up and a little bit to the left. But this mount is a German Equatorial. Uh, the issue with the German Equatorial is um, it is very good at tracking. It's really annoying to find stuff right near the pole. Um, because you kind of have to flip it either one side or the other. And in this case, because I'm looking at uh, going a little bit to the east of North Celestial Pole, I want the mount to be way over to the west. So now, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. This is going to not be fun. So I am actually going to kill my light for a minute just so I can see so I've gone all dark on you sorry about that but um, I need to be able to see what I'm looking at to find this thing manually there it is so I have a um, I have a teleview red dot sight so I can use that to find it nope it is hard to lean over and see this thing in front Easiest way to do it, I'm going to find Polaris and then I'll move it. That's the right way to do it. If I can find Polaris, I can move it up and then a little bit over and then I'll be good. I can find Polaris. I have 
no idea how close I am. Uh, if at all. So, uh, I don't know if you can see, but I'm actually sitting down uh, so I can see where this thing is pointed at. I know that kind of makes for, for boring videos, but. I am in the general area. Where's the in the general area? Not exactly sure where. So I'm going to bring up another instance of backyard EOS. Um, uh, backyard EOS is quite nice because. Um, the licensing allows you to have, I believe it's two versions running on your machine at the same time to control two different cameras. So we'll go ahead and load it up. So what I'm going to do, what I am going to do is uh, have this running on the second um, Canon that I have, which is on the refractor. The refractor is a sh much shorter focal length, um, it's 504 millimeters. Um, but it's a um, it gives me a very wide field of view and that's what I'm looking for right now any minute any minute Let's see if there are any questions uh, do, 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 do. Do yes yes John it is Arabic a lot of our stars are um, have Arabic names, um, Al in front of it, uh, and that is because um, during the golden age of Islam, uh, science was very, very important. And when the um, when people in Europe were in the Dark Ages and just starting to come out of it, um, very, very, very good uh, Arabic astronomers were mapping the night sky and they were naming stars. So I'm going to do connect, and it's going to give me the other one. So which one did I connect to? Which one did I connect to? Which one did I connect to? I don't remember. That's the problem with having two identical telescopes. OK. I'm going to guess I, get, I got the first one. Yes. Okay, cool. So we'll do framing and focus real fast. Uh, again, nothing. So this red thing, this is, um, these are hot pixels. Uh, hot pixels mean that um, it's basically just a damaged pixel on a, um, um, on the chip. So it's, it's just always showing. Doesn't matter, always showing. So I'm going to go here. Anything? No, no, it's fine. All right, we're going to back to, to imaging. So I'm going to take a quick image. Uh, we're just going to do a, ooh, I don't know, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. We'll do high, high ISO because I just want to get it. Um, I, oops, mirror. Mirror lock, turn that down. Um, I, I just want to see what's in there, what's in the field of view. Um, I don't really care about anything else right now. Um, I want to see if, if it's in focus. I want to see if I'm picking up anything there. Um, and I actually put a focal reducer on there. This is a Hotec. Uh, I think it's a 0.8. It's specifically meant for fast refractors. So I think I'll get a little bit wider of a field of view out of it. Um, if necessary, I actually have a uh, um, uh, astrophysics 0.66 uh, image reducer as well. Uh, you can see, ah. 
Okay. Uh, see some stars. Um, that's all I can see. So... Kind of boring, huh? Let's, let's jump here. Because I want to see what am I supposed to be seeing. Uh, Atlas, Atlas, Atlas. Field of view. Sky guide. Advanced find. Uh, field of... No, no, no. Cancel. Uh, where is my... Sky Guide? No, no, no. I keep forgetting. Turn off the Sky Guide. I want... Uh, I want that to stop. So I want... C... C slash 2019 Y4. Now I want to see, what stars am I looking at? Well, I see three over here and there. Let's see what that looks like. Three and that, maybe. No, not exactly. Here's three right there and one down. Um, oops. I'm going to kill that. It's kind of hard to see. You, you have to figure out what you're looking at. I don't think I'm seeing anything in there. But what I'm going to do is just for kicks and grins, I'll do a 20 second exposure. Um, just to see if anything fuzzy pops up. Uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, if not, I'll start hunting around. Um, yeah, if I had the, the daub out, I could probably hunt it down a little bit better. But it's not too easy when... Um, I know there's a way that I can type in exactly what I'm supposed to be looking at, and I don't remember how. It's been a while since I had to manually do this. See, any questions? Any... Um, the location of Comet is not Doobie Mayhar. It's off uh, Doobie Megrez. Well... It's not what my thing is showing, so... At least right now. Okay. I see no fuzzies. I don't see any fuzzies. So I don't think I'm looking at the right location. Um... Or maybe we can zoom out. Anybody recognize anything? I don't. All right. So, I should be looking at this guy. This guy. See, he's like just about... It's almost due north of Polaris. So maybe that's what I should try doing is, well, I thought I was in the area. Actually, what's this? Two, three, yeah, I'm, I think I'm close, but I'm not exactly sure. Anyone, anyone have any idea? Uh, oh, College Sports Network. We are looking for Comet Atlas C 2019 Y4. It's a little bitty fuzzy bit but it is starting to light up. So I'm going to go back. Um, I'm going to do something boring and look at my, my handset for a sec and see if I can figure out where I can do this. Um, back. Help. General. No. Nope. All right. Deep sky. Do, do, do. Name. Nebula. Name. You see. Open. No, no, no. What if I hit, I don't want a name star, I want something, is there anything in here that I can track on? Like that one. Oh great, that'll be fantastic. Uh, it'll definitely have that one. Oh, here we go. That might not be too bad. That'll get me at you pretty close. Rho Ursi Majoris, maybe. 
Maybe. No. No, I don't think that will. No. Does it have an SAO number? So that's something else to look at. No. Okay, so some stars have additional catalog numbers. And let's see if I can get a description, other data. I don't see an SAO number. <sighs> SAO number stars, SAO. Mm. Does anybody remember? Move up the screen. Yeah, I'm trying to find that name star. The only one I can find is Rho or Psi Majoris, and I don't see anything else. Let's see. Ah, well, let's do this. Labels. Uh, stars. Show all labels. Let's see what we can find. Atlas. Hit one. Yeah. Uh, so I got a couple stars here. But that's all I got. Yeah, I, I don't know why this isn't connecting. Um, I'm going to try one more thing to get it to work. Um one more shot. I hope this does it. If not, I'll be relatively annoyed. Um, I think John said that uh, we need to move it up. Um, we will try that next. This does not work. So, what I'm doing is I'm taking this thing back to the mount and I'm going to be plugging this into um, Lights are on. Try this once more. Should have left the device manager up. There we go. Ports. COM7. All right. Once more, with feeling. Promise won't click the sub. <gasps> it says it. Could it be? Did I cast the right spell? Oh. <sighs> nope. <laughs> All right, well, permission denied. I don't even. In case anyone's wondering, I am actually running as a uh, as local administrator. Um, I would have no idea why permission would be denied. Uh, I can try one more thing. I know this is kind of boring. Um, doop -doo, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I, I. Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. <sighs> All right, we'll leave it the way it is, and instead just try to hunt it down. Um, okay. 
Let's see how close I am to it again. Actually, I'm going to try something else. Um, okay, so I'm see how well this works. I'm going to get one of my cameras. This is a, um, okay, so this works fine. Ooh, here we go. So I'm using an application called SharpCap, and I'm using one of my dedicated astronomical cameras, and I'm going to... See if I can get a better exposure. I don't even know. Okay, I need LX mode. Now we're going to go here. I'm going to capture a four second frame and see how well this works. Uh, eight seconds. So, what this is doing is this is actually capturing a frame. Um, you can see the little scroll bar at the bottom, and it's capturing an image. Um, however, I don't think this is going to work too well. And the reason why I say that is because this is a tiny little 30 millimeter guide scope. I'm not even able to pick anything out. Um, that, and I don't have anything bright enough to focus on. So that's not going to work either. Anyone have an idea? Okay, so John, last four digits of my cell phone. Um, uh, I don't remember. Uh, five seven eight zero. Yeah. So John's gonna send me something that assumes that I know where my phone went. Um, where I put my flashlight, where I put anything. Where is it? Here we go. Okay, I've got no messages yet. I do have my cell phone. Where did I put my light? There it is. Okay. Great. So again, any suggestions on what we should try? Um, since this isn't working too well, uh, I'm actually going to get a much longer exposure. I'm going to jump back into Backyard EOS, so you can grab another image. Um, it's going to be bulb, another 20 second exposure, start exposing. Let's see, maybe, maybe luck. I went down just a little bit and see if that does it. Uh, if not, I'm going to go right back to Polaris. I'm going to go straight up and see if I can just hopefully capture it in the field of view. So it's now 10 o'clock. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's getting a little bit late, but it's not too bad. Okay, so we have about a 20, about 20 second, 30 second delay on, uh, on live. Um, so let's see what this one's gonna be like. Noise reduction. Don't see anything there either. No. Once more. Hey, but the temperature has gone down. Went from 49 degrees down. I still don't see anything. Still don't see anything. Okay, John, don't have anything from you yet. Right, I'm going to head back. Uh, so I'm going to point it at Polaris and then go down from there, or go up from there. Um, Uh, 
That's what I was doing wrong. All the way over. That's pretty even. Okay. I think I figured out what's going on. I wasn't totally over. Um, and so uh, when I went up, I was actually too far to the east. Let's try this again. Here. Two screws. Try this again. Um, 27 degrees, that's not too bad. Do another capture. So um, when I had the telescope pointed earlier, when I had the mount pointed, instead of having the bar, let's see if I can do this a different way. Oh, there we go. I had something. There we go. Okay. So here's a level. The counterweight swings out in one direction. I had it too low, and so when the mount looked up, it was at too far of an angle over. Instead, I had to make sure it was level. Once it's level, now the telescopes can go up and down, because I only needed to go up and just slightly over, just a tad. I think I was going over too far. So now, Just download. Ah, there it goes. <gasps> That's it. We got it. We actually got it. Okay, cool. So here we go. There it is. Right there. Oh, that makes me happy. We've got a comet. How cool is that? It's not big, but it's fuzzy. So let's see if we can bring out a little bit more detail to it. Oh yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, so that brings out not much of the coma. Let's see. Uh, anyway, yeah, we can see we can see the the uh, the comma, comma coma. We can see the comma around it now. So this is the um, this is basically the the gas and the dust and uh, the the vaporized well water vapor that the sun is heating the comet and it's vaporizing off of it and it forms a huge cloud around it. So the comet itself may be, you know, 10, 15, 20 kilometers across, but the comma can be millions of kilometers across. Um, just gigantic and, and but it's very tenuous. Um, there's there's very little density of material in there, but it's enough that sunlight reflects off it and we can see it. So let's go let's go some more. So I'm gonna go deeper. I'm going to go for a 60 second exposure, but I'm going to cut this down to 1600 and let's go from there. So that's cool. We managed to pick it up. Um, we picked it up on the wide field scope um, and we can also switch to the 8 inch. We can also take images through the 8 inch too and see if we can get a little bit more detail, see what that's like. Um, you can see my focus is not perfect on, on the stars. Um, at this moment, I don't care. I managed to pick up a comet um, and the comet's going to be a a blurry spot anyway so 
uh, I'm not really interested in perfection at this point. I, I'm just happy we found it. Uh, so I guess y'all are y'all are seeing that now because um, let me see what John sent. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is actually the site, John, that I was looking at um, earlier to try to find exactly where it was. So um, the the fix did it uh, instead of trying to go for um, this with the with the counterbalance out at an angle, straighten it out. I could go up directly to Polaris. Once I was able to go directly up to Polaris, then um, I could just tiny bit over, and then it was good. So all right. Let's see what this is going to look like. Another minute for noise reduction, and um, I could try to get a little bit better focus on it as well. Um, there aren't that many stars there, so they're not really coming in bright. But I have a, uh, um, I modified, I modified all my telescopes apparently. Uh, I modified the teleview with a, um, I think this is a 11 to 1 reducer. Uh, for the focuser so I can get really really fine focus on it uh, but it is the standard teleview rack and pinion if anyone cares uh, which is still you know pretty good um, but it's it's not a Crayford it doesn't have that fine granularity of a Crayford uh, okay cool so so we managed to get it that's that's nice I'm happy um, how many people do we have on uh, 25 users right now okay that's not too bad um, I haven't really been paying attention to that, but uh, like and subscribe. Okay, here we go. So, had a little bit of wind, had a little bit of motion, um, but we can see the fuzzy right there. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out again. Uh, the fuzzy is really, really obvious. Um, I'm going to see if I can't get it closer to the center of the field of view, because um, I want to switch over to the other scope and see if we can get better luck with that too. The wind noise isn't terribly bad. Uh, let's see, what are we looking at? So. We're going to do this. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Um, I think what I need to do is motor speed. I'll do four. Okay. Back. Do. Okay. Down. I'm going to take a quick instead of a 60 second exposure. I'm going to go back to a 20 second exposure because uh, I want to center this thing out. And I'm going to do. Uh, yeah. Let's do that. So real fast and that annoying sound that you hear when um, it's uh, it's done that's uh, just really annoying um, I'm going to switch to internal speakers I'm gonna turn it way down because it's super annoying so again all I'm doing is I'm trying to center it out in the field of view to make it a little bit better but we do have some wind picking up again. That kind of sucks. Um, it's going to make it a little bit shaky. But we found the comet, which is pretty nice. I'm I'm pretty happy with that. Um, not perfect, but not bad at all. And we have a lot of light pollution in the skies there too. That's why it's so green. Um, we're actually. Since I'm down in Burleson, uh, we're looking up towards uh, downtown Fort Worth, pretty much due north directly. So this is light pollution from that. Come on. Okay, so instead of going down, I need to go six. Okay, and I'm gonna do one more. Another capture. So. Um, we can see the direction it moved, it moved in the opposite direction I really wanted it to. Um, yep, so I'm moving in the other direction, and then I move it up. <sighs> I 
let's see, got a question. Matthew, what's the comet's apparent magnitude tonight? It's like, it's pretty low. I think we're looking at it in here. Um, I didn't even say. I think it's supposed to be at the max. Um, well, not, I think I was reading something today about eighth magnitude. Uh, you should be, if you have an eight inch scope, you should be able to pick it out. I'm picking this up with a, um, with a four inch apo. Um, so an, an eight inch, it should be pretty visible. Um, oh, and I have actually a comet filter on this camera. So a, a comet filter is, um, it's like a, um, okay, there's that. So I'm going to take a couple more. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, This is kind of the way it goes, but that's okay. Um, so a, a comet filter uh, is a specialized filter that blocks out light. Um, I don't want light pollution. I'm still getting it, but you know I don't want it. Uh, what I want instead is just the light from the stars, just from comet, just from, from nebula. So um, if you're taking pictures of nebula, then you'll have filters like um, hydrogen alpha, um, oxygen three, sulfur two. Uh, those are the three that the Hubble uses to take its pictures, and it, it does like a false color uh, image of the nebula that uh, that it images. With comets, um, they give off other stuff. So what I'm looking for is oxygen, and I'm looking for um, two particular wavelengths of excited carbon, because um, they're basically dirty snowballs. So I want, um, you know, carbon is the the soot that's basically all over the thing so i'm going this direction uh i want uh that carbon that carbon's being excited by radiation from the sun so that's what i want to see um and there are two particular wavelengths that i'm looking at and this filter will block all light well most of the light except for oxygen three because we want um um, the oxygen from the water that's being disassociated from hydrogen um, by the sunlight that is also giving off some light. Uh, we want the excited carbon um, and we want to try to block out everything else. So if you have a, um, uh, a, a comet filter, it makes it easier to find it because what it does is it darkens the background, it gives more contrast to the object that you're looking at. So it's not so much that it makes it brighter, it makes the background darker and it makes stuff like this stand out more. So that's what we're trying to do. So we got it right here. Let's see where it goes. Well, how did that happen? Well, that's like not what I wanted. You know what? I'm going to go a little bit faster. Okay. Yeah, this is taking a while. So, again, I'm just trying to get it to the center of the field of view, but, uh, yeah. Ooh, magnitude 5th right now, according to John. Um, hoping for 2-ish by May. That would be lovely uh, if it, when it hits perihelion, um, as close as approach to the sun, it should still be visible for us. Um, just because of the angles and if it gets the magnitude too that should be really nice that that should be a a naked eye object right there this i think if it's if it's a five right now i don't think this is naked eye um but with a decent telescope it should be fine especially if you're at dark sky site so if you're at home and you have pretty dark skies um, this would be something to to shoot for now all right noise reduction Come on, baby, go in the right direction. Or am I just going back and forth? Am I not paying attention to what I should be paying attention to? Okay. Okay, now. Okay, I want to do one more. This one should get me in the right position. Oy. Oh, let's see. Has there been tons of... Oh, cool. This has been tons of fun. Thank you, Felicia. Um, I'm not going to say bye, Felicia, yet. 
this is actually the first time that um, that we've done it. So typically what we'll do is we'll have uh, star parties um, open for the public. Uh, we'll have them at, um, let's see, here in Fort Worth we have it at Tandy Hills. Um, then we'll have them at Dinosaur Valley as well down in Glen Rose. But um, we can't do that now. So we don't really have the uh, the option to have gatherings of 100, 150, 200 people. So instead, this is kind of our, our first attempt at this. We're seeing how, we're seeing how well this goes. Um, there was actually another star party um, that I... Seriously? All right, I'm gonna try to go in the other direction. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, there's another star party that is in the uh, University of Florida Seminole. Um, they're having it on Friday on the Fort Worth Astronomical Society's Facebook site. I have a, um, a post for that as well. So you can take a look um, um, on Friday. I think they're, they're actually going to be shooting for the same comet and looking at some other objects um, if their weather holds. So I talked with the, uh, with the person who's doing it there. So if she's watching or if he's watching, here you go. Um, good luck. It's not too difficult to find if you know exactly where you're looking. Uh, I don't think we were too far off the first time. Um, I think we're just a little bit to the east. So, oh, come on, baby, let's, let's get you centered. Um, it's just kind of hard to move the telescope a lot in the right direction. Um, ah, there we go, good. Um, Okay, so this should be a lot better for center, um, and I'm going to switch over to the other one. So we were on here, and I'm going to switch over and do uh, 60 second at 800, and let's see if we can find it in this field of view. Um, may find it, may not, I don't know, we'll find out. Uh, but this is a larger telescope, the focus is actually slightly better on this one. The other one is just, just not in focus right now. Um, not in really sharp focus, uh, at least. And APO has really, really good imaging, um, but I'm being kind of lazy right now and not doing it. Um, it's 1019 right now. Uh, it is uh, getting a little bit late, but we're still good on time. Um, it's getting a little bit colder. Uh, cameras, this one on 31 degrees Celsius. We had it at 49 earlier uh, at about sunset, so we're still going. If anyone's asking, this is uh, M42. This is the Orion Nebula. We were imaging this earlier with the 8-inch uh, Ritchie Cretan. Cretien. It's French. So we're almost good with this one. Let's go back to the other one. Let's see how close we are to the center. This is uh, it's a bit better. We were here, we're there, so I'm going to go with a little bit more. Alright, that ought to do it. Do a noise reduction now, Let's see what we're doing. So again, this is uh, M42. Okay, Felicia. Oh, cool. Um, on the big screen. Nice. You can see a lot of details. So here's uh, just uh, while the new image is still going. So we're looking at M42. It is a little bit blurry. Um, we had some some motion mount jumped or something, but we were able to pick up some decent detail out of the uh, the dark nebula here that's obscuring the uh, the lighter colored nebula. Looking at the previous image, um, it's a lot less uh, less blurry. Um, we didn't get as much detail, but the background was darker, so I think the contrast was nicer. Uh, ah. Well, well, that's not good. So we had some motion there. Maybe me. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, it's not. Oh, oh, cool. So um, this is the. Uh, um, this is the guide scope. I'm not worrying about the guide scope right now. Uh, it's taking images 
that's fine. I'm gonna let it keep taking images. I'm gonna jump to here. We're gonna go to this one. No, that's what we're already on. We're gonna go to there. Okay. Well, nuts. That's not where I wanted to be. <sighs> All right. Try this again. Um, okay. Once more. If you think this is boring, wait until it's one o'clock in the morning. It's 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and some of your equipment is starting to um, do over or frost over even. And now you're out there with a hair dryer trying to do imaging. So, all right, John, have a good night. John's going out. I just saw his message. Um, all right. I could probably do a little bit faster, but um, let's see what 20-second exposures are like. I'm, I'm just trying to get it closer to the center of the field of view, but the wind is picking up a bit, so it's going to be making the scopes shake. I'm actually glad I put the, uh, um, the four inch on here. Um, uh, Bill Nichols, one of our club members in November, uh, decided that he was going to gift me um, with a, ooh, that's nice, a, a, uh, a five inch Acromat refractor. And I thought today, hey, it'd be really cool if I take that thing and put it out on the mount. And then I thought, it's kind of windy. And a big telescope is basically just a sail. So, uh, no big telescope. Um, I left that in, in the office and I took this one out. I think these two are compact enough that it, the wind isn't affecting it too much. Um, but yeah. So if uh, anyone's joining us, um, we're looking at Comet Atlas, otherwise known as C2019 uh, Y4. This is a newly discovered comet. It was discovered, I think, in December and uh, it is just now getting a little bit brighter. Please be in the right direction. Oh yes, good. Okay, now it's pretty close to center. Cool, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna bump this up to 30 seconds and I'm gonna knock it down. Now let's do 40 seconds. Knock it down to 1600, start the capture. I'm gonna jump to the other camera. This one, yeah. This one, and I'm gonna do this one. Knock that down to 50 seconds at 800. Start the capture and see what happens. So. I'm actually imaging with two cameras at the same time. And if you're being pedantic, three cameras, but this one is uh, out of focus completely. Uh, it's a little guide camera. I'm not doing anything with it. I'm not worried about it. Um, I just shoved it on there. Oh, for kicks and grins. So, let's see what this is doing. All right. That one, and I guess I could. Oh, there we go. Noise reduction time. Okay. Um, there's one amateur astronomer that I know of that what he did in order to double his um, ability to take images, basically double his exposure time per night, bought two mounts two identical telescopes, two identical cameras, two identical guide scopes and guide cameras, identical everything, um, just so he can get in twice the number of images per night. And it works. It's a way of doing it. Um, I would say get one big heavy-duty mount and mount a bunch of cameras on it, or a bunch of telescopes with cameras on it, like I've got, but you know, to each his own. Uh, Okay, here we go. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Okay, that is a cleaner image. So we knocked down the ISO, went from 3200 to 1600. Uh, There's a lot less noise, um, made the exposure a little bit longer. So let's do a 60 second exposure and I'm going to keep the same ISO. Um, so let's zoom in. Let's, let's see if we can take a look at what's going on. Okay, so the stars are pretty decently round. Um, I think I could get tighter focus, but it, it's actually fine for now. So here's what we got. Here in the center, move it out. 
that little bright spot in the center, that's going to be the nucleus. That's going to be the actual center of the comet. Um, this fuzziness around it, this is the comma. So I'm going to see if I can enhance it slightly. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's a pretty decent enhancement. So here, the nucleus is now a lot brighter, and you should be able to see the, the comma around it probably about that bigger. So it probably extends out a lot further, but I'm not taking a long enough exposure, and this is not dark enough of a sky to really see that. Um, I don't see a tail. Uh, if we saw a tail, it would be going away from the sun, so it would be going in this direction. Um, I think uh, uh, it actually depends on where the uh, how the camera is oriented and, and depends on the telescope type too. But uh, I'm not seeing a tail right now at all. So either our exposure is too short, or um, there is not really a tail yet to see. Uh, let's look at the other one. Okay, so we have it on here as well, and uh, we got some streaking. So we're not guiding terribly well, which is fine. I'm not worried. Um, but we do see right there, getting hit by bugs. Uh, we do see the, the nucleus right there, and we do see a, a comma around it. Um, it's, it's a little fuzzy, but it's definitely there. So I'm going to kick this up to 60 seconds, and uh, I'm going to say 1600 ISO. So let's start capturing this one and see what we can get out of it. Back to this one. So we got a couple more seconds um, of exposure, another 10 seconds, and then we'll do another 60 seconds of noise reduction. Um, as a reminder, uh, Canon cameras have a the Canons have the ability to do in-camera noise reduction. So as soon as the image is done. Uh, it will go ahead and close the shutter, take a second image, and basically that's the noise. That's um, that's heat noise, the in, basically infrared from the camera itself, electronic noise off the chip itself, and it will go ahead and subtract that dark noise uh, from the light image and hopefully clean it up a bit. Um, it's not perfect, but it's better than just leaving a raw image. So with this program, I actually have the ability to control the telescope. I have the ability to control a filter wheel. I have the ability to control a focuser um, that are all electronic. I don't have a focuser. My filter wheel is packed away. And also it's set up for uh, 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 hydrogen alpha, sulfur, and oxygen. Um, and uh, the telescope control is not working. So I'll have to troubleshoot that and see what's going on. But not tonight. That would be truly boring for everyone. Okay, so here we go. Um, downloading. Come on. It's, is it good? Is it good? Is it good? Ah, it's not that good. So these are one of the images that we're going to toss just because we have that streaking. It ain't good. We don't want it. Start another capture. Back to blue. What do we have on here? Noise reduction. Try it again. 15 more seconds. So. <sighs> any other questions? Anyone have any any suggestions? We still have oh a half hour, so we don't have to stare at me imaging a comet for the next half hour. Um, we can try to shoot for something else. I'm not sure we'll be able to hit any galaxies just because of the light pollution, um, but it's always a possibility. Ah, yeah. See, so. Um, there we are. We have light pollution, we have streaks, so, but you can actually make out the fuzziness of the comet. You can make out a little bit more of the coma around it. Let me do reset. Maybe a little bit darker, but um, it is visible. Something is there. And you can tell that this is not a star. It's not a planet. Um, it could be a galaxy, but we don't have any galaxies in that area. Uh, so, um, uh, but we don't have any galaxies that bright in that area. So it's definitely not a galaxy. So when you're looking for comets, you're typically looking with um, refractors, you're looking with uh, with like eight inch, 10 inch reflectors. Um, 
there are some Japanese companies that put out really neat binoculars that are dedicated to comet hunting. Uh, they are uh, four inch, five inch, six inch binoculars, um, and the the eyepieces come out at a 45 or a 90 degree angle, so you can actually comfortably have it looking up and you looking down and not trying to crane your neck at weird angles. Uh, but they are very, very, very expensive, and um, I am not made of money, especially right now. So, um, if you're looking into doing something like this while we're waiting for exposures to finish, um, you can start off with pretty cheap astrophotography as well. You can do something as simple as putting a DSLR on a tripod, hitting bulb and getting a cable release, clicking it, and letting it go for a minute or two minutes and you get some nice star trails you can pick up some some details out of stars um, and that's something that you can do with probably equipment that you already have yeah we're getting more streaks so one i'm not guiding two it's just in a weird position and also if you look back at this mount it's way over so it's kind of can you see that it's hanging off to the side. Um, yeah, it's probably hard to see. Let's do this. So. If I can light it up. There we go. So that's how the, uh, the scope is set up right now. Um, that's not good. There we go. So it's uh, it's set up to uh, um, for dual imaging. I've got two two telescopes. There's one telescope right here. There's another telescope here. There's a little guide scope right here. This is the Celestron um, uh, StarSense Auto Semi Auto Magic alignment device, and this is a waterfall of cables just falling out of everything. But that's the way most telescopes are. Okay, so um, if you want to do something like this, this is a lot more complicated. Uh, it does get to be more expensive, but you can do something like, um, like what I do is buy everything used. You don't have to have everything new. Uh, there are actually websites, uh, Astromar and Cloudy Nights um, are online forums, whoa. All right, at this point, I know something's wrong. Okay, we're no longer tracking. Um, I think we hit the we hit a limit on the on the mount, and I should be going to the other side. But all right, I think we're done with the comet. Um, so, what else can we look at? Um, let's go ahead and switch back over to this view. Here we go. So, as you can see, uh, that's pretty damn ugly. Um, I do not like that at all. It means that there's something wrong with the tracking. And if I go to this one, exact same thing. So this tells me that there's an issue with the mount. But if we just go back a couple, um, we were actually able to see a comet tonight. So I don't know if you've never seen a comet before, um, but you did get to see one today. Uh, it is kind of cool. I think it's cool. Um, I had hoped to see it today. And I did. So I'm just playing with some of the levels on here. If I can get it. No. Yep, there we go. Yeah, that this histogram uh, or the, this curves modifier is not the greatest of things, but that's fine. Uh, we're able to see that. So I'm going to jump over to Starry Night. Okay. And we can see just how far everything's moved over. Um, what else is good? What else is good? So instead of looking at comets, oh, there are lots of comets, pan stars, rain cube. So we have some satellites coming from the field in the field of view. Um, Borisov? No, this is a different Borisov. I'm thinking of uh, the interstellar one. That one is breaking up. We got a lot of comets here too, but they are so dim, they are so small that um, they're just really hard to see and we're not gonna bother. So instead, let's do this. I'm gonna turn off labels, 
planets, comets, pulsars, ooh, uh, meze objects. Let's see what's a good meze object. And hopefully a meze object in this area. We have the pinwheel, pinwheel galaxy. We have the whirlpool. Let's pick up the whirlpool. Let's see what we can get with the whirlpool. I'm not terribly optimistic, only because this is M51. The only reason why I say that is because we got lots of light pollution back. So I'm going to hit uh, deep sky. I see Messier 051. Enter. Enter. Uh, that wasn't a good sign. Okay, I'm hoping this works. Okay. Looks like it's in the right direction. Where are we looking? We are looking at um, tail end of the Big Dipper. Lots of little satellites around. There are always satellites. Something that I like with the DAB is if you're observing something and the satellite just gets into the field of view, you grab it and just keep following. You just grab the front of the scope and just keep following, 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 following until the satellite falls past the terminator and goes into shadow. All right, so next. And try this. 60 second exposure for that one. Come here. 60 second exposure for that one. So we'll see what happens. Um, back to here. So we can talk a little bit about this. So Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, what's interesting about this one is this little satellite galaxy. And I'm going to center this thing. Uh, select. No. Where is it? So this has a little feature where I can center it, and it'll keep it centered. Um, the application actually tracks how the Earth is moving. So as you um, focus in on a single image or single object, it will track further and further off the screen. Um, so you have to center it and lock it in place, so to speak. Um, anyway, Whirlpool Galaxy. This is a uh, face-on spiral. Uh, what that means is that you're seeing it from above or below, doesn't really matter, um, but you're seeing the face of it. And what we're also seeing here is all these red bits. Let's zoom in a lot more. There we go. So this is a Hubble image. Let's do this again. Select it. Center it. Center. OK. So here's what we're looking at. Um, the red areas all along here, these are red emission nebulas. Uh, what they're doing is um, there are stars there that just like in the Orion Nebula, they're lighting up the hydrogen gas and that hydrogen gas is glowing red. And you have that with hot young stars. So these we call the emission nebulas. Um, the dark bands all through here, these are dust clouds. Um, there isn't really any star formation going on in them. We see this long tail connected to this galaxy. Well, this one's small. This one's a small elliptical galaxy. It doesn't have any uh, any arms to it. It doesn't really have any shape other than round-ish. So we call them ellipticals. You see a lot of stars out here. You see a lot here. And you see a lot along in this arm. And what's happening is the um, uh, the gravity of this much larger galaxy is sucking in material from this one and triggering star formation along here. It's just sucking it all in, and, and there's additional star formation along here. There's a lot of emission nebula through here. There's a lot of small, bright blue stars. Let me go deep into it. Yeah, you guys, you see, there's a lot of stuff all through here. So. Um, it's a really, really pretty Hubble image, and we can get deep into it and see a lot of detail through here as well. So what you're seeing, these are actually individual stars in another galaxy, and we can actually resolve them. We can see these individual stars, but these stars are big, they're hot, 
Um, they burn fast. They're bright. They're blue. Um, blue and white for the most part. So let's see what our version of it came out as. Yep, that's it. No, that's, that's really it right there. That is our image of the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's not nearly as good as Hubble, is it? But we see... Let's see if I can get a little bit of a processing on it, a little bit of curves. So these are the two centers. So this is the larger center. This is the smaller center. And that compares with... with this and this. But we're missing the arms and... We're missing really any any type of detail in there only because our exposure is way too short. If I bump this way up, I overexpose it, we can see just a hint. There's a little bit of round something. There's a round something there. Okay. I don't know how well you can see on YouTube, but I see a little bit of round roundness. It looks like a ring almost around it. And there's a little bit of round fuzziness around this one as well. It's not easy to see, but it is there. Uh, if we magnify a lot, we see a little bit. There's a little bit. But again, it's because we have such a short exposure. So if I do 100 second exposure on this one and try again, I'm not even going to worry about the, the refractor. Um, it's a wide field instrument. This is a fairly small target, so uh, I'm just not going to worry about imaging with that one right now. Instead, we'll try 100 seconds and see how well that gets us. Um, then probably drop it down to 800 ISO as well. Ooh, a little bit of wind. So it is uh, 15 till 11. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting a little bit tired, so I think this will be our last object of the night. Um, but it is an interesting one. Let's see what we can do with it. Um, we got to see a nebula. We got to see the planet Venus. We got to see... Uh, so we saw... Um, from the beginning, we saw Venus in its half disk form. Um, we saw the Orion Nebula. And then we saw Comet Atlas C 2019Y4. And now we're looking at the Whirlpool Galaxy, uh, Messier 51. That's not too bad of a night. So this, uh, this program, uh, Backyard EOS, is kind of nice. One of the things I really like about it is, well, actually, it's very nice. Um, kudos to the developer. Um, one of the things I really like about it is this estimated finish time that it has. So I can actually program in a set of exposures and kick them off and um, go open up a thermos of nice warm tea and drink that for a while and uh, go to the bathroom and then sit around and take a nap and do whatever I want to do and come back and my imaging is done. And I don't have to sit and click start capture every single time. I'm just doing one at a time now because I don't really want to do anything more. Um, we're just taking single images. We're not doing any anything special. Uh, I'm not even doing a live stack. Uh, maybe next time um, I actually have some good astronomical cameras I can do a live stack with. Uh, we may be able to get some more details out of it, but this is not too bad, especially for, uh, for DSLRs. Um, we're in light polluted skies. We're not going to get terribly great images anyway, but this is not too bad. Um, at least just to see a little bit. Uh, anyone have any other questions? Anyone, maybe one more object to, uh, to jump in on? Um, if this one doesn't come out too great, if we have too much light pollution, we can go south. Southern skies here are a little bit darker. We're going away from, um, from the city lights. So I'm going to zoom out. Ooh. Swing to the south. Not to the east. Uh, oh, Virgo's coming up. Okay. Uh, Ryan. Down here we have some nebula, but they're kind of hard to see. I kind of wanted to get... Um, Oh, M48. We can look at the star cluster. That's not bad. M48 is pretty good. Uh, I wanted to get some um, 
the rosette, but the problem with getting the rosette is it has it's it's big. The rosette nebula is I think it's about three. I want to say it's three full moons across. It's, it's very large in the sky, but it has a very very low uh, surface brightness, um, so it's really hard to see. And imaging it is basically hydrogen alpha filter and a ten minute exposure, and nobody wants to wait, wait for ten minutes. So what do we got? Man, it's gonna be hard. Okay, so I can see a little bit of spiral. Why should I bring it down? That's you can see a little bit of spiral action in here. So it looks like there's an arm coming out here. Maybe something coming out here like this. It's it's hard to see, but there's at least something there, and we do have some fuzziness around here. I think our limitation is basically that one, it's too short of an exposure. Two. Uh, we have too much light pollution in um, in our suburban Burleson skies. Um, if we were further away, I think we could get away with uh, with much longer exposures. If I was down in Grandview, um, I think it could be better. But then again, that's also looking up in the light pollution from Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, but it's, it's at least better south of Alvarado. Uh, if we were in our dark sky site uh, north of Ranger, I think it would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, if we were up in Decatur, or north of Decatur, I think it would be fantastic as well. The skies up to the north there uh, and to the west are, are quite dark. Um, I think our limitation is just that we're, we're here. So, a couple more minutes, we're going to jump over to a star cluster. Uh, we haven't seen a star cluster yet, so we're going to go to uh, M48. This is an open cluster. Okay, back. M048. All right, so you can see the scopes are moving. It's not terribly loud. It doesn't annoy the neighbors too much. Everyone's home anyway. Okay, everyone should be home anyway. Every, yeah, everyone should be home now. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is a uh, um, an open cluster. So what is an open cluster? We have two typical types of star clusters that we talk about. We talk about uh, globulars and we talk about open. Globulars are outside of our galaxy. They're a group of several hundred thousand to more than a million stars and um, they form just kind of a globish shape. They all kind of uh, orbit around the center. An open cluster is different. An open cluster is much fewer stars, a couple dozen to even several thousand. Um, but open clusters typically formed in the same gas cloud. So they're kind of a family. Um, they may have formed at slightly different times, but their basic elements of composition are all going to be the same because they came out of the same you know, star cloud. Um, so what's interesting is we can actually look at these clusters and we can analyze the light coming from them. Let's go ahead and start on image. I'm going to do this one because it's the wide field. And see how close we are. Hoping for the best. Um, so, in these, you know, the 60 second exposure. I think 60 seconds is going to be a lot, but we'll see what happens. We can always go down. Um, open clusters. You have a cloud like the Orion Nebula, and stars start forming. Well, those stars don't just stay in the cloud, they move away. Our star formed in a cloud as well. Um, and after a couple million years, it moved out. Also, star clouds don't, la or gas clouds don't last forever, dust clouds don't last forever. Um, tidal forces, um, gravity just ca causes them to spread out, become more tenu less tenuous uh, over time. The stars that light them up move away. And if they're not being lit up, they're no longer a reflection nebula or a, a emission nebula. They're now a dark nebula. And a dark nebula against a dark sky, you may not even notice it. Um, in fact, we actually found a lot of dark nebula because they are um, um, opaque to visible light, but they are transparent to infrared light. So we can actually see stars on the other side of dark nebula 
by imaging with infrared cameras, infrared telescopes, especially ones out in space. With these open clusters, um, the gas has already, if it's not gone completely, it's mostly gone. So all you see is just this group of stars. Uh, sometimes they're together in a bunch. Sometimes they've spread out a lot. Um, sometimes they spread out in one direction. So the Pleiades is one such cluster. Uh, it's actually down too close to the horizon. My house is blocking it. Um, the Pleiades, we see it end on. It's actually very, very long. This is the Seven Sisters. Um, it's long away from our field of view. So we're looking through it. So it looks like it's all together, but in reality, it's all stretched out. So if we could see it from the side, it's actually quite long. But we're seeing it in this direction, and it all comes together. So let's see what this image is going to be like. There we go. It's not half bad at all. So it's not quite in focus. Um, you can get the other one on and get that one see what this one's going to be like. 100 seconds is way, way too long for a cluster like this. We can do, we can get away with 20 seconds easily. Yeah, I can see a little bit of, uh, of um, spiral something there. It's not much. With a whole lot of processing, spending probably an hour or two at this, at this one image and just really, really working hard at it, I could have a very disappointing night and have nothing um, because there's just not enough data there. Uh, you really need a lot longer exposures. You need darker skies to see anything. Um, yeah. We managed to image it. That's all that we managed to do. Um, one of the suggestions was to do a mini Messier marathon tonight. I do not have the energy for a, a Messier marathon. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a Messier marathon is, uh, we talked earlier about Charles Messier, the French guy who looked for a comet, couldn't find any comets. Uh, he found lots of stuff which wasn't comets. Oof. Scope moved, so we doubled everything again. Oh boy, yeah, scope moved. This is scope moving, this is not an optics issue. Um, so, let's try it again. Um, so, Charles Messier found a bunch of objects that weren't comets. This object here is is one of them, uh, M48. Um, it's kind of fuzzy in an eyepiece, even though it is made of stars. Uh, it's just a grouping of stars. So a Messier marathon is something that um, a lot of purists don't like. But in March, it is a special time of the year. Because what we can do is um, spend the entire night from sunset to sunrise and get every single one of the 110 Messier objects in the field of view of your eyepiece one after the other. Not in numerical order, but in observing order. It is a challenge. It is very hard to do, especially because some of them um, at the start of the night may be still in the light of twilight. Uh, and not easily visible, and then the dawn might catch you before you get the last couple um, um, before the sun comes up. I have done, I think we've done two. Yeah, we've done two, but it's been several years since we did it. And we now have a four-year-old, so he kind of goes to sleep at 8 o'clock at night, so that kind of crimps our style. Um, but he... Um, Man, I'm tired. Okay, anyway, so Messier Marathon, you spend the whole night looking at these objects. If you time everything just right, you have eight minutes per object. That is not a lot of time. You are not supposed to use electronic aids. A star chart is fine. Go to on your telescope like this one is not supposed to be fine. Um, you're supposed to do everything from star hopping. You're supposed to find a star, look at your map, go over go up, down, left, right from that star, find the object, check it off your list, go to the next one. Uh, there are a lot of objects which are really close together which makes it easier and, um, and you can 
you know, pick out three objects in about a minute. Uh, and that gives you more time to find some of the more obscure ones, some of the ones that are harder to spot with low surface brightness. I think the last time we did it, no, uh, the first time uh, my wife and I did it, we had a 16 inch daub and we had the uh, the four inch apo on a go-to mount. So what we're doing is using the four inch go-to, find the object where it is, then jump to the push to daub and search for the object. The 16 inch gives a lot more light gathering ability. Uh, we could find it, um, we could see it a whole lot better, just all the objects. So um, that was fun. I think we got like 96 objects out of 110 that night. But it is, they call it a marathon for a reason because by the morning you are completely exhausted and have got to take a nap before even trying to drive home if you're at a remote site. Okay, uh, we do have some ocean. It is not the best of images. Um, the stars are not round. That's fine. I don't really care right now. But this is what you kind of see. Through the eyepiece of the telescope, you actually see a... Um, ooh, we even got more stars. So you see a bunch of stars. A bunch. If I um, push this even more, you can see even more stars coming out. If I make the exposure longer, if I do a 30 second exposure, and I'm going to do 30 seconds, but I'm going to drop it down to 800 or so. Um, let's do 40 seconds. So I'm going to do a much longer exposure, but I want the background to be uh, less noisy. And we'll see how many stars we can come out of there with. And by jumping to this one, again, it's this is a wider field, but... This is a scope that has the comet filter on it, and because it has the comet filter on it, the colors are going to be weird. Um, it's perfect for picking out comets. It is not perfect for picking out anything else. So, yeah, I haven't done any more imaging with it, but we can just do another one, 60 seconds. I think 60 is overkill. Um, I'll do 45 seconds, but this time I will wait until one camera is done, just in case there's just a tiny little shake. There we go. I'll start the capture on there. Go back to this one. So now we have 33 seconds left for noise reduction. Um, if you didn't see us earlier, noise reduction is something that Canon cameras have built in. Uh, you can set it as an option in the custom functions. Uh, what it does is it takes your normal image first, closes the shutter, it takes a second image. The second image is basically noise of your chip. Um, it is electronic noise, it is heat noise. It's that graininess that you see in uh, long exposure images. Then it takes that dark frame and subtracts it from the light frame, and hopefully you get less noise overall. Um, I have tested it. Yes, it does work. Um, here we go. Downloading. Downloading. Come on. Any second now. There it goes. Well, is that it? Well, we got something. Um, Something? I thought we had more. All right, let's go to the other one. See how much more? 20 more seconds for noise reduction? Okay. So we'll see this one in all its green glory. Um, there are actually ways of, of reducing the color, of getting the color back out to, to black, but that's a, something for another time. Okay, let's wait for this one to be done. Downloading. Downloading. There we go. Darker. Okay. So, reset that. Let's zoom in, see some of these stars. Again, not terribly in focus. I didn't bother focusing this morning, or sorry, this uh, this evening before we started. But there weren't any stars out before we started. Um, I have some focus aids that really help. Um, some masks, but uh, I didn't bother setting them up. Which is fine. We got close enough to focus. So, M48, I think I'm going to call tonight. It is 11.01. I'm tired. I have to get up and go to work in the morning. And by going to work, 
That means I have to walk about 50 feet to my office. Um, we are stuck at home um, because of COVID-19, and that is the reason why we're doing virtual star parties now instead of in-person star parties. Um, in-person is a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing them. Um, I have the meteorites. I take the meteorites out and um, I show them to people. I have some interesting ones. Um, something that I plan on doing pretty soon is a meteorite presentation uh, as a video on YouTube. Um, back in January, I did a presentation for the club on meteorites. It was uh, simplified to the point where anyone could understand exactly what's going on, um, what meteorites are, the various different kinds of meteorites, and why they're important, where we find them, things like that. Uh, I don't go into details on specific subtypes. Um, there are people who find it really, really interesting. Um, but it's not really something that most people really care about. So it's not something that uh, makes for a good presentation. Instead, we talk about different types. We talk about where they come from, how we know where some meteorites come from. I actually have something really interesting. I'll just go ahead and pull it out now. Um, so this one is... <laughs> Let's do this. Let's light this up. That's too much light. Way too much light. So I'm going to knock that way down. Yeah, here we go. How about this? That's still too much. Oh. There we go. How's that? So this, in the baggie, is a Howardite. Howardite is a meteorite that comes from the asteroid Vesta. How do we know it comes from the asteroid Vesta? Well, we have the rocks. We can analyze the rocks that are in our hands that fell to Earth. But we also sent a mission to Dawn. Sorry, we sent a mission to Vesta called Dawn back in the early 2000s. And what Dawn did was um, orbit around and around and around Vesta. Let's see. Okay, so let's pretend this meteorite is Vesta. So we sent Dawn, went around and around and around and around, and mapped the whole thing. It also had a spectrometer on it. And what the spectrometer did is it measured the light from the sun reflecting off of the asteroid, ran it through a spectroscopy, a, yeah, spectroscopy device, and filtered out particular wavelengths of light, specifically in the infrared. And by doing that, it could figure out what minerals are on the surface. And as it was mapping it, it discovered that it's got these big, deep gouges on it. One in, in specific, um, that's basically a crater. Something large hit it between 20 and 35 million years ago or so, gouged out through the crust down into the deep mantle. So what we have is rocks on Earth from that impact. And um, we have asteroids from that impact. So one asteroid got hit by something else, knocked off pieces, and now those pieces are asteroids as well. We call them the V-types. So by looking at Vesta, we were able to determine that the stuff that we have called Howardite is crust material from that asteroid. The stuff that we have called eucrites is magma material from Vesta, basically like the, the necks of volcanoes um, that solidified. And then we have um, diogenites and we have um, olivine rich diogenites. And those come from the mantle. So if you think about this, on Earth to get to the mantle, we have to drill through 16 to 30 something kilometers of crust to get down there. We haven't been able to to do it yet, to get down to the Moho. Um, but from rocks that just fell to Earth, we have samples of um, shallow and deep mantle material from an asteroid. And I think that's pretty damn cool. 
Um, Meteorites are basically free sample return missions. So I will be doing a presentation soon um, on meteorites, and I will also be talking about some of the ones that I have and what makes them interesting. Um, if you missed it earlier, before it got dark, we actually brought out a couple, looked at um, a, uh, um, a little chondrite, and we looked at a lunar meteorite. So. I'm, uh, I'm going to call tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'm, again, Chris Mojnitsky. I'm the president of the Fourth Astronomical Society. And it's past 11, so uh, have a good night.